Why is this game so hard? Celeste, Celeste, whatever you want to call it, is an indie 2D platformer developed and published by Matt Makes Games. They should really change their website's URL. This game started development all the way back in August 2015. Celeste's gameplay was designed to be minimal and accessible, featuring game mechanics to make the game more complex, while at the same time also adding in stuff like an assist mode to make the game a bit less challenging. The game was initially developed for the Pico 8, a virtual machine and game engine, and it was later known as Celeste Classic and appeared in the final product as a hidden minigame. Celeste was released on January 25, 2018 for the Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 4, Windows, Mac, and Linux before being released on Xbox One the next day and on Google Stadia in July 2020. Alright, let's try this game out. This game looks charming enough, so it can't be that difficult, can it? Can it? Alright, here we are, so we can jump, climb walls, and dash. This game has 8 chapters divided into many single screen challenges with checkpoints in case, you know. Some of these levels contain paths leading to optional challenges and hidden collectibles, with the main collectible being the strawberries. These strawberries don't serve any purpose besides being fun little collectibles, but you can get an achievement if you collect all of them. Of course, since this game is made to be challenging, there is a death counter for each level. So our goal is to reach the summit of Celeste Mountain, which is actually a real-life location, though in this game it is a more fictionalized version to fit with the theme and setting of the game. And along the way, we encounter a bunch of characters who help us reach our goal, while others try to kill us. I think. So this is the first chapter of the game. This chapter introduces many of the main game mechanics. Every chapter in this game takes around 20 to 30 minutes to finish, with some of the chapters being slightly longer. This first level is a great introduction to the game. It somehow manages to be challenging, but not too difficult at the same time. Of course, since this game is challenging, you're going to die a lot. But it doesn't make you rage a ton, well, at least for me. As the name of the chapter implies, we are in an abandoned city, with the whole place snowing and mechanical structures broken or destroyed. This first chapter is great, but it can be a bit challenging. Now moving to the plot, we are introduced to a hiker named Theo. Theo explains that he came to visit the mountain to explore and take pictures. So we return to climbing the mountain where, at the end of the level, we encountered a memorial and decide to make camp there for the night. So we wake up and enter an abandoned site with space-like blocks scattered around the place. We encounter a mirror and our reflection appears to be a darker version of our character. That darker version of us escaped through the mirror and the space blocks can now be interacted with. By dashing into these blocks, the blocks transport us from one side to another. However, you'll die when you dash into a space block and it transports you straight to a wall. So we find our reflection sitting by a dead campfire. The reflection reveals to be a part of us. You're welcome. Our reflection tries to convince us to stop climbing the mountain. Of course, we refuse and now we have a chase sequence. And this is where everything gets more intense. And by that, I mean the part where you're going to die a lot. I don't hate this part of the level, in fact I think this part is pretty good in terms of gameplay and narrative. It's such an adrenaline rush and it's really exciting, but maybe for some people this part might be a bit longer than it needs to be, but I don't really have complaints about this part of the level, it's just great. So our reflection stops chasing us and disappears. We pick up a payphone and we are answered by a guy who we have a confusing conversation with. Our reflection appears in front of us, transforms the payphone into a monster, and eats us. And would you look at that, it was all a dream. Do I have to say it twice? So we come across this bridge with this dark goo that can kill us and we make our way to a hotel slash resort. The hotel owner, Oshiro, appears in front of us and convinces us to stay here, though we really have to get going. 
Oshiro insisted on taking us to our room, so we followed him. On the way, we encounter a bunch of obstacles with the dark blue again. There are also these gates that can only be opened by activating these orbs. They can be pretty tricky to get to, so keep that in mind. Then we enter a room with a bunch of stuff scattered around. Oshiro says that it is hopeless to clean this place up while being overdramatic. So we decided to clean up the place and Oshiro is very thankful for that. He wants to kill us! We have to dash mash the jello so that everything gets cleaned up and we have to do this three times. After smashing a jello, you have to find and talk to Oshiro so that he can open the other two paths to each one of the jello. I don't see why we need to talk to him to open up these paths. He could have just let them open for us after we found him in this room in the first place. And while heading to one of the jello, we encountered Dio trying to get out of this place. And I'm honestly curious as to why he's here and what he's doing here. I know both of us are trying to climb the mountain, but why would he feel the need to enter this place besides, you know, shelter? And even then, how the hell did he get here before me? So Theo escapes through the vents and waits for us outside while we try to help Oshiro and his hotel. Our reflection showed up and said some hurtful things to Oshiro. He gets mad, starts chasing us, and we run for our lives. Here we have another chase sequence and honestly, I think this one's a bit easier than the last one. Oshiro turns to normal and he asks us to leave. Good luck with the repairs I guess. This chapter is the worst by far. It features wind mechanics and other new objects such as the clouds, green bubbles, and moving platforms that can be triggered by the player's interaction. The clouds give you a little jump boost when timed correctly, while other clouds disappear the moment you jumped on them. The timing can get a while to get used to in order to get the jump boost. Once you jump or dash into a green bubble, it will make you dash into whichever direction you're facing. But it will make you dash almost instantly, so you better react quickly. Do note that the green bubbles reset your dash allowing you to reach a further distance. And then we have these moving platforms. To get these platforms moving, you can either jump on them or cling to their sides. If they touch a wall, it'll take them a second or two to vanish and then reset to the place they once were. Some of the moving platforms allow you to change their direction manually by simply moving the left thumbstick to the spot where you want to go. And now we have this. Remember in Ninja Gaiden 2 about the second level with the wind mechanic? This one might be worse. Since this game consists of tricky platforms which require you to time your jumps consistently, the wind makes everything way harder. Near the end of the level, I keep failing over and over because of the timing, the platforms, and the wind, obviously. I guess this is karma for not having any lungs. Now back to the story, we meet the old woman who we met earlier in the first level. She tells us that we should give up considering the dangers that lie ahead, but we continue regardless. At the end of the level, we arrive at an old looking gondola. Theo arrives and we both use the gondola to go up. Theo takes another selfie with us as our reflection appears on top of the gondola, causing it to stop and thus, we have a panic attack. Theo tries to calm us down by teaching us a coping mechanism he once learned. We calm down and the gondola starts working again and we arrive at the top of the ravine. This chapter takes place in an ancient temple. The entire area is pretty dark so you might need to light the torches scattered around the place by going near them. It's easy to get lost in this place and it might take a while to figure out how to progress and move on to the next area. This chapter introduces tons of new stuff. First up are these red bubbles. They're like the same bubbles from the last chapter but now they act more like the space blocks from the second chapter and you can cancel the dash manually by dashing yourself. We have these blocks that move whenever you dash. These things react fast so you gotta time your jumps properly. There are also these huge buttons that open gates whenever you dash into them. Back into the story, Dio enters the temple before us and now we gotta find him. We encounter him inside the mirror so we have to find a way to get him out. On the way to find Dio, we find a giant mirror that sucks us into a portal and into someplace else. Then we take control of this squid-like monster. We find ourselves and kill ourselves. Feel free to use that quote. We escape that place and the whole temple seems to be freaking out. 
Our reflection appears and she tells us that this whole thing is caused by us. We make our way through and this is where the annoying part of the level comes in. Do you remember the squid-like monster we controlled earlier? Yeah, now there are tons of them and they are trying to kill us. Just like us, they have the ability to dash. They can destroy these orange blocks if they dash into them. We also have these barriers that prevent these monsters from getting into us, but man they're brutal. They follow you everywhere and they act like homing missiles and sometimes they can be pretty difficult to dodge. So we make our way through and enter another huge area with multiple pathways leading to smaller areas. Just like earlier, it's really easy to get lost in this area without the torches lit and it gets more irritating with the fact that there is one of the monsters in there. So just try to stay away from that thing so that it can't chase you everywhere. In this area, there are two gates that you need to open to enter the next area. And since there are two gates, you need to find two keys that can be found in one of the sub areas. So we find Theo who is trapped inside a crystal, which means we have to carry him throughout the end of the level. While carrying Theo, you can't dash but you can still jump, but my goodness this part is annoying. While trying to get out of here with Theo, you gotta complete some chores first. Whether be it activating shields or opening gates, it's annoying. And when you're near a gate that takes you to the next area, there's little to no movement for you to jump when the monster is trying to dash at you. And don't get me started in this part. Two of them? So we reach the end where a giant eyeball is blocking the way, we throw Theo at it, it dies, and we escape. This chapter may be my favorite of the entire game. It's one of the most important chapters story-wise, and the chapter's atmosphere and level design are so lively and colorful. But then again, it still has the difficult platforming. This chapter introduces the feather, which allows us to fly in any direction for a short period of time. We also have these brown platforms where if you dash against one of their sides, the platform will charge in the direction of the side that you dashed against. The platform will continue to charge until it collides with a wall, which will move the platform back to its initial position. Before we proceed with the level, we and Theo started a little conversation detailing what happened in the previous chapter and why both of us are climbing the mountain. Then we get to a short dream section where we are introduced to the feathers. We confronted our reflection, try to come to terms with them, of course the reflection denies, we wake up, and we fall all the way down. We encounter the old lady once again and she gives us some words of wisdom. She also tells us that the reflection is scared and we should confront her once more. We find and try to help her, she denies, again, and we get another sort of chase sequence, except this time we chase her now. All we gotta do is to get close to her and she'll move to another position. Whenever you do this, she'll bounce off and blocks will either fall from above or move in certain directions. In every phase, she gains new attacks like throwing orbs, targeting lasers, and shooting more orbs. I really like this sequence. Not only is it fun and engaging gameplay wise, but also adds to the narrative of this chapter and the entire story. But like previous chase sequences, you're gonna die here a lot. The reflection finally gave up and now we decide to work together by giving a power up. Now we can dash twice in a row. The whole gang arrives, another conversation, and the chapter ends. So now we have reached the final chapter of the game as we climb from here all the way to the summit. This chapter contains all of the elements and mechanics from the previous chapters, including this, this, these, this, and this. No! This, 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 and this. Not only those, but they also included the settings and designs of the previous chapters. It's really cool to see all the previous chapters crammed into one big finale. Now, of course, since this chapter contains everything from the beginning, this chapter retains the difficulty of the mechanics of the previous levels. Now you might think that this chapter just inserts a previous section of a certain chapter and calls it quits. Well, no. Since we got Mario Kart Double Dash from the last chapter, they designed the levels to challenge this new gimmick we got while also trying to stay true to the level design and mechanics of the certain chapters. 
At the end of each level, our reflection shows up as a purple orb. Once we get close to it, we are lifted upwards and we are taken to the next level. But what does this chapter call for its own besides including previous levels? Well, this chapter has its own level where we are nearing our goal to reach the summit. This entire level doesn't contain a ton of gimmicks from the previous chapters, except the feather from the previous chapter. It mostly involves streaky platforming, tight jumps and dashes, and precise timing. You're gonna die a lot here, which is why there are tons of checkpoints scattered around the place. There are 28 checkpoints here, so you know that this level will take a lot of time and attempts to beat. This felt like the final challenge of the game, except that it isn't. Either way, this entire level is challenging, and I mean it. It is challenging even without all the gimmicks from the previous chapters. This felt like the challenge because the entire progression in this level depends on you, your timing, and your skills. There are a lot of areas that require said things, and most of them require you to be quick on your feet, meaning you need to react as fast as possible. Moving back to the story, before transitioning to the next level each time, we get a little conversation with our reflection, recalling the events that happened in the previous chapters. These, these conversations didn't feel useless as the whole point in climbing this mountain is to confront our inner conflicts, which is what we did in the last chapter and what we're doing right now in this chapter. Nevertheless, we have finally reached the summit. We have a little heart-to-heart -heart conversation with ourselves, deciding about what we should do next or to return home. We insisted on taking a few more moments admiring the view, and then the chapter ends. But is it really over? No. We return to the old lady's cabin where we'll be celebrating. The whole gang arrives and we'll be baking a strawberry pie for everybody. Now if you collect all of the strawberries before completing chapter 7, you get a different ending depending on how many strawberries you collected. And so far, in my first playthrough, I got this many. Not my best, but at least I got more than 25. Chapter 8 introduces a ton of new features, most notably the inability to recharge dashes. Now on the outside that doesn't sound too much of a problem, but the levels here are insane. Without having to recharge dashes, you really need to work on your timing in each area. Now before progressing the entire chapter, there is this gate that blocks you from going any further. In order to get through the gate, you need to backtrack to the previous chapters and collect a total of 4 crystal hearts. Once you collect enough hearts and pass through the gate, you are now in hell. There are fireballs scattered around the place and when the place turns cold, they turn into ice balls that have spikes on the bottom and can be jumped on the top. We have these blocks which will launch a player in the direction that they were touching it from upon being grabbed or landed on. When the environment is cold, these blocks change and they turn into a different kind of block that slowly sink when grabbed or landed on and shatter afterwards. We also have these hot bumpers that can kill you upon contact and when it is cold, these things turn into those bumpers that are found in chapter 6. There are also conveyor walls that launch you upwards when you grab into them, and when it is cold, these turn into ice balls that you cannot grab onto. There are these barriers which are either ice or lava that can kill you if you get close to them. They'll appear or disappear depending on whether the switches are toggled to hot or cold. Now speaking of switches, these things toggle everything between hot and cold. When flipped to hot, the bumpers turn into hot bumpers, shattering blocks into launching blocks, ice walls into conveyor walls, ice balls into fireballs, and the lava gates disappear. When flipped to cold, it does the same thing in reverse. Now that's a lot of gimmicks to take note of. But surely it can't be that difficult, after all this isn't the final chapter of the game, so they might be saving the difficulty from the final chapter. Right? I cannot stress how much time I spent trying to get past this section. It took me so long but I still got it. I won, but at what cost? And the latter half of the chapter, really challenging. It took so many attempts, but I managed to beat it. 
Oh, I almost forgot the story. Sorry. So we return to the mountain about a year later to explore the mountain's secrets. We are told that the core of the mountain has extreme power and will affect our abilities. After roughly 844 deaths, we enter a dark room. The room is empty, yet it feels nostalgic somehow. This is the final chapter of the game and was introduced as a free update to the game. This chapter is by far the longest and most challenging chapter of the entire game as it introduces tons of new objects and mechanics. The first one is Double Diamonds. In the second subchapter, we lose the ability to dash twice. These double diamonds act like the green gems from all the previous chapters which reset your dashes. But this time, these double diamonds do the same thing but grant us the ability to dash twice. Next we have these exploding fishes. We can bounce on top of them but these guys explode which pushes us in a certain direction when we're right in front, behind, or below them. There are these large jellyfish that can be grabbed to increase hang time. While holding, you can change the speed to fall more slowly or quickly. Normal movement, jumping, or wall jumping are all possible while holding a jellyfish while they must be released in order to dash. Holding onto the jellyfish does not consume stamina and they do not replenish our dashes. These jellyfish are not affected by most surfaces except for these barriers which instantly destroy the jellyfish upon contact. Next we have these futuristic looking platforms that function very similarly to the conveyor belt platforms from the previous chapters. Then we have these generators. When dashed twice, they will remove all electric obstacles from the screen for further progression. Lastly, we have the bird. It launches the player to the right similarly to the purple orbs from the previous chapters. Now that we have all of those out of the way, let's talk about how hard this chapter is. They weren't kidding. This is just the first part of the chapter, and I've died a hundred times. I've spent nearly a total of two hours getting past the first four sub-chapters, and then there's this. Remember the blue gate from chapter 8? Yeah, well it's back now and you have to collect 15 hearts to progress. This means you have to collect all the crystal hearts from every previous chapter in addition to the hearts of the b-sides. Now, what are the b-sides? They are shorter but more challenging versions of a specific chapter. And don't even get me started with the b-side of chapter 2. I've spent so much time trying to get to this heart. I could have spent all that time trying to get a life, but no. I have to fully beat this game for the sake of existence. This is my curse. I have to beat this game, even if only a few people watch me do it. Nothing is impossible, and I can beat this game. I got all the hearts I needed. Now for the final challenge.
Yes! There's a cutscene? So we're somewhere in the future and we visit the gravestone of the old woman whom we had developed a strong relationship with. We see the bird as a part of the old woman and set off to space. We attempt to catch the bird multiple times. In the process, we begin to accept that Granny will be truly gone forever. Together, we decide to help free the bird that we had cornered, sort of a tribute to Granny. Afterwards, we meet Granny for the last time. We apologize to her for not attending her funeral and thank her for helping us on our journey up the mountain. Granny slowly disintegrates and shortly after, we wake up. We start chatting with Theo who had tried contacting us for a long time. Theo then shows an old photograph of Granny and Theo's grandpa. Finally, we are happy that our experience climbing the mountain with Theo was just like that of Theo's grandpa and Granny. So we have finally finished the main story of Celeste. What are my thoughts? It was a roller coaster of emotions, I can tell you that. The story tackles depression and anxiety, and what I think the game is telling us is that you have to embrace or work alongside the things that bring you down so that you can reach your full potential. Celeste is full of emotions that we all feel and some are completely dominated by. Our main objective was to climb the mountain, but as we dive deeper, progress more, it wasn't only the mountain that we have to overcome, but ourselves. And that right there really grabs my attention in this whole story. It's ironic that a game about dealing with stress gave me stress. This game is ruthless to an extent, but it mostly doesn't feel unfair at times. The gameplay is simple and easy to learn at the get-go, but as we progress to each chapter, it gets more and more difficult to adapt these gameplay mechanics because of the added gimmicks in each chapter, right? Each chapter introduces something new that you have to learn, but not in a way that you have to totally master it, if you know what I'm saying. And one thing I, that I like is that whenever you fail, you pick up where you left off immediately. And it's not like in Cuphead where they show your progress through a level and the enemies mock you to piss you off. Celeste doesn't have any of that, and I think that's good because in a way, it somehow correlates with the main theme and message of the story. Despite being the hardest game I've ever beaten yet, this game is a masterpiece. There's a lot to love about Celeste. The story, the smart mechanics of the game, the beautiful soundtrack, the challenging but fair gameplay and level design. They've put a lot of thought and care into this small yet expansive package. And I can't believe I spent 18 hours just trying to beat this game. I should probably go to sleep. Oh hey, don't mind me, I'm just pitching some new ideas for a new Halo game. Concerning the current situation of the Halo franchise, I want to see if I could make a better Halo game than a multi-million dollar company. If they mess up a well-known ID, surely I couldn't. Halo Infinite launched in an incomplete state. It released without some of the most iconic and memorable features of the past Halo games that the development team promised even before the announcement of Halo Infinite. No split-screen co-op, the ability to play as elites, game modes like Infection, and more importantly, Forge. Infinite launch with little to no variety of content. Even if Infinite does have all of them, the progression system sucks. Having only a limited number of weekly challenges and being able to unlock only one item every time you level up a battle pass is dreadful. Back when it launched, the only way you can get XP is by completing challenges and that's it. Not only that, but when you see a cool looking armor core, you have to spend a ton of money. Customizing your experience was a huge part of the Halo experience, and with Infinite having accessories and other cosmetics locked behind the paywall, even with just the color you want, it's lame. I mean, it's pretty obvious since the multiplayer launched for free ahead of the campaign. Modern first person shooters are heavily monetized these days that it doesn't feel fun unlocking some cool cosmetic by purchasing it with real money. Now, besides all that, no post-game lobbies? I mean, that's where you can talk with your teammates and enemies and that's fun, but 
No, the only way you can talk with someone is when you're in a game. Voice chat is crucial in the ultimate social experience that Halo is known for. Sure, someone might call you the n-word, but there's a certain magic that voice chat has in a video game. Now let's move on to the campaign of Infinite. I think the story is okay. Nothing groundbreaking, but it's entertaining enough. But I hope Infinite's campaign doesn't turn out like Halo 4 or 5. One common problem I find with Halo 4 and Guardians is that they don't connect in terms of narrative. It's like when you play 4 and 5 or 5 and Infinite, you feel like you're missing something. Like you never play the Halo game that connects these two stories. And if this happens to Infinite, it's going to be a total problem for the next Halo game. Now speaking of the campaign, do you remember the rumors of that Halo Infinite is getting a campaign DLC? Yeah? Well, the DLC is scrapped unfortunately. So no new content except for the multiplayer. Now one good thing that happened to multiplayer a few months ago is that Forge has returned and the community is already making some stellar maps. Like there's so much creativity in these maps than the ones 3 for 3 made and that's saying something. Still, even with all of these new features added to this game up to this day, Infinite should have been released in a complete state and with what's happening right now, there's little to no hope left for the future of Halo. Now should Tree for Tree step down and let another video game company take care of Halo? Well, if it were to happen, Halo is most likely going to be passed on to Bethesda since Microsoft acquired the company not too long ago. Bethesda made some of the most awesome video games ever made, Doom Eternal, Skyrim, Wolfenstein, and Fallout. But here's the thing, if a new Halo game is released by Bethesda, what if it would turn out like Fallout 76 at launch? See, here's the thing I'm worried about. G4 Tree Industries is the only video game company that I know that has enough knowledge to make a Halo game since they have some if not most employees that used to work at Bungie, the original creators and development team of Halo. I don't want to see Halo be acquired by a video game company that has no common knowledge of how a Halo game works. So let's have another example, Activision. They're well known for making the modern Crash Bandicoot games, but more importantly, Call of Duty. If they were to make a Halo game, they could put some mechanics from the modern Call of Duty games like customizable weapons and loadouts, and that sounds fun and all, but if they just turn it into a sci-fi Call of Duty game like Infinite Warfare, they fail to make a Halo game. So that's where I come in. Am I supposed to type the alphabet? Just to be clear, I have no idea how to make a video game. I'm still in 9th grade and you expect me to learn this? What button should I press? But the least I can do is to throw some concepts and ideas and that's what I'll be doing right now. Now before I begin, I just want to note that the majority of what I'm going to say is strictly my own personal preference of a future Halo game. So if you have different views or ideas for a Halo game, I'd love to hear them. Right now, Halo, Tree for Tree specifically, needs to hear the opinions of the community better to fix Halo Infinite and the franchise as a whole. But for now, I want a new Halo game and I want to make a new Halo game. This doesn't mean I want a new Halo game now, but when Infinite is showing its age or it's not doing any better in the future, I'll save up some concepts that I want to see in the next Halo game. So let's begin. Of course, we better begin with a title for a new Halo game. Let's take a look back at the previous Halo games. The first 5 Halo games generally have numbers on them up until Infinite. Calling the next Halo game Halo 7 just doesn't feel right. It would just make Infinite look like a big budget Halo spin-off game. So this new Halo game needs to have its own subtitle like with Infinite. We could go for something like Halo Zeta, where the setting of the game is in the title just like with Halo Reach. But if I were to pick a title, it should connect with the story of the campaign and that's where a problem is. I'm not gonna go too deep into the story of the next Halo game. There are many possibilities here, but right now I'm just going to state some things that I want to see in the next Halo game. First, it should pick up right where the campaign of Infinite ended. No unnecessary time skips. I don't want any of that. Like I said earlier with Halo 4 and 5, I don't want the next Halo game to feel like you missed something during or after the events of Infinite. Secondly, it would be nice to see the return of some fan favorite characters like Arbiter, maybe even Amanda Palmer from Halo 4 or the surviving members of Fireteam Osiris from Halo 5. Maybe even June from Halo Reach, who knows, he might still be alive. 
Lastly, I don't want the campaign to be too complex, but just the right amount of complexity to be entertaining to both diehard fans and newcomers. Again, the possibilities are endless for the campaign, but hey, those are just the kind of stuff I want to see in the next Halo game. Now this is where things spice up. The multiplayer. The first thing I want for the multiplayer is to have the magic of the original Halo games, specifically Halo 3, pre-game lobbies and post-game lobbies. They are the most important things to have in a multiplayer game and should not be overlooked. Proximity chat. I've seen many games have this feature and it sounds so fun. Being able to talk with your teammates within a few meters adds this extra layer of depth and immersion to the game. I also want to return map voting. Being able to choose which map you want to play is far better than just getting a random map without the ability to vote. Next is the customization of Spartans and Elites. I want the customization to be almost the same as Halo Reach. You can purchase cosmetics for your Spartan using credits you earn by playing the campaign and multiplayer. I also want the customization of Elites to be the same as the Spartans. We only get to choose specific classes of elites, which is okay enough, but I want more. I want different unlockable designs and cosmetics for each class. I want more variety in terms of customization. I also want to return loadouts, specifically the ones from Halo 4. The loadouts should only allow the player to customize their weapons and grenades. I'm still trying to figure out if I want the return of the armor abilities from Halo 4 or just include the field items in infinite like the grapple shot. If you put two and two together, it'll just be complete chaos, which on one side sounds fun, but it'll be hard to balance them out in a competitive play. So I'm just gonna include the field items in Infinite since they're not too OP than the armor abilities in Halo 4, but I will include the tactical package. Then again, I don't want to include some ridiculous tactical packages so that everything is balanced. And while we're at it, let's talk about the progression system. I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this. Listen, some of you might like the battle royale-like progression system of Infinite, but we need to go back, specifically 2010. I know, I know, my nostalgic love for Reach may be a bit too much, but don't forget that everything I've said up until now is my opinion of a new Halo game. Deal with it. Let's continue. I want to bring back the original progression system of Halo Reach. It's much more organized and you don't have a progression system where you only unlock one cosmetic by leveling up each time. Whenever you level up, you unlock more cosmetics for your character. Now you still need to purchase them with credits so you have to play some more campaign missions or multiplayer matches, but I don't want it to feel too tedious. I want the progression system to be more enjoyable. Now, I don't want any in-game purchases that use real money. I want things to be what they once were back then. Next are the game modes, basically all the original game modes from the original Halo games. Slayer, Oddball, Griftball, King of the Hill, Capture the Flag, Assault, Territories, Juggernaut, Infection, and VIP, maybe even Firefight. We haven't gotten Firefight since Reach. Of course, you can't have a Halo game without Forge. I want Forge to have more features than ever so that experienced Forge creators can make maps that are incredibly detailed and fun to play. And then we have the weapons. <sighs> the Assault Rifle, BR-75, Skewer, Shock Rifle, Mangler, and Sentinel Beam from Infinite, DMR, Needle Rifle, Plasma Rifle, Spartan Laser, Fuel Rod Cannon, Focus Rifle, and Plasma Launcher from Reach, the SMG, Brute Spiker, Carbine, Shotgun, Brute Shot, Beam Rifle, Rocket Launcher, Gravity Hammer, Energy Sword, and Sniper Rifle from Halo 3. So that's pretty much everything I want of a new Halo game. Sure that may be a bit too much to ask, but honestly, I don't care. I like to talk about stuff not everyone agrees with, such as Pineapple on pizza isn't that bad, only two genders exist, there isn't any good music nowadays, Lego Marvel Super Heroes is the greatest game of all time, and me making well written, expertly edited, top of the line episodes of a series many love watching. I can't believe I put this in the script. Oh hey, wanna know why I've been gone for so long? Yes! That's right, I've been grinding on Halo Infinite ever since I started talking about it. And I'm going to be joining a tournament called... A Halo tournament that only exists for the sake of this episode. The name convinced me. 
Gaming competitions, generally called esports, are gaming events where competitive players challenge other players in a specific game. There are a ton of games that make their own gaming tournaments. Call of Duty, Counter-Strike, Valorant, Fortnite, Overwatch, Halo, Pokemon, the list goes on. But I'm waiting. But as you can tell, the first person shooter genre or FPS genre is pretty common in esports tournaments. We got multiplayer online battle arena games, MOBA for short, which includes games like League of Legends and Dota, fighting games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and Smash Brothers, and then some of the more complex genres like card games and even puzzle games like Tetris. Gaming competitions have always been a thing back then, but they were not as popular or talked about before. A simple gaming competition, in my opinion, is two people trying to one-up each other and try to get the highest score. Now, I was still in my pre-fetus era during this time, but I'm going to assume that some people, if not most people in the arcades would usually do this. If I were a kid back then, I would show off and boast about my high score in Dig Dug. The earliest known video game competition took place on October 19, 1972 at Stanford University for the game Space War. The students were invited to an intergalactic Space War Olympics, whose grand prize was a year subscription to Rolling Stone, a monthly magazine. Now I wasn't born around this time so I can't really judge its worth, but I'll just assume that this was a pretty big thing back then. The winners were Bruce Baumgart who won the 5 man free for all tournament and Tovar and Robert E. Maas winning the team competition. Ever since then companies like Sega have been holding their own gaming competitions, but everything changed with the release of Street Fighter 2 in 1991. Street Fighter 2 was a revolution. This game popularized the concept of direct tournament level competition between two players. Before Street Fighter 2, most video games rely on high scores to determine who is the best player. But this changed with the release of Street Fighter 2, where players would instead challenge each other directly, face to face, to determine the best player. This gave way for the boom of competitive multiplayer found in modern action games. Moving back to 1990, Nintendo held the first ever Nintendo World Championships which toured across the US and held its finals at Universal Studios Hollywood in California. Three 1990 World Champion titles were given, Jeff Hansen won in the Under 11 category, Thor Ackland in the 12 to 17 category, and Robert Whiteman in the 18 plus category. There was no official competition round to warrant a single player. However, after the competition ended, there was an informal face-off between the three winners, with Thor Ackland taking first place, Jeff Hansen taking second, and Robert Whiteman finishing third. The winner in each age category was awarded a $10,000 US savings bond, a 9090 geometric convertible, a 40 inch rear projection TV, and the golden Mario trophy. But there was none more prolific than the Nintendo World Championship cartridges. There's no real evidence regarding how many of these were made, but the ones that are made are considered to be the most valuable NES cartridges of all time and one of the rarest. Now what did these cartridges contain? Three customized minigames based on Super Mario Bros., Rad Racer, and Tetris, and the only objective is to achieve a high score. That's it. There's really no reason to find and buy one of these cartridges other than for novelty purposes. You can get a much cheaper price with all of those three games separately than you would with a Nintendo World Championship cartridge. These cartridges don't contain the full games. Afterwards, Nintendo held another tournament in 1994 for the SNES called the Nintendo Power Fest 94. Like the previous Nintendo World Championship, Nintendo produced around 33 cartridges for the Power Fest, however, only two exist. The rest were returned to Nintendo where they were reused for parts. When internet connection became more prevalent in video games, John Romero, who's known for designing early FPS games like Doom and Wolfenstein 3D, established competitive multiplayer in online games with Doom's Deathmatch mode in 1993. Since then, competitive gaming has become more popular than ever. The popularity of online streaming services has helped the growth of esports in the early 2010s. Back then, Twitch, which launched in 2011, frequently streamed popular esports competitions. In 2013, viewers of the platform watched 12 billion minutes of video on the service, with the two most popular Twitch broadcasters being League of Legends and Dota 2. The modern esports boom has also seen a rise in video game companies embracing the esports potential of their products. Now we have tournaments hosted by the big three, Nintendo, Xbox, and PlayStation. As a kid, I've always wanted to be in a tournament. 
I don't know why, I just want to sign up for one. Even though I've only been fighting Dead Spots at Black Ops 2 because I wasn't allowed to play with anyone online at the time. But you can still tell how much I want to be in one. But now... Uh, no thanks, I just push mo. Ever since I became an official dweeb, I became less and less competitive in gaming. I don't play against pro players or play ultra competitive games because I just want to enjoy playing the game, which is what a game is all about. But some games are designed for competitive gaming in mind, heck, even an entire video game genre is designed for it. Now calling esports an actual sport is a controversial topic. You see, pretty much every sport requires physical activity and training. This requires you to sit, stare closely to your monitor, and press a bunch of buttons. We can go on and on and on about whether esports classifies as an actual sport, but here's my opinion. I view esports as an actual sport. Why? Well, let's take a look at one sport that doesn't require much physical activity, yet is still officially considered to be a real sport. Chess. The International Olympic Committee considers chess to be a sport due to the fact that chess requires skill, and eSport also requires skill. But you can disagree and state your own opinions. Do you really think my opinion matters when I said this? LEGO Marvel Super Heroes is the greatest game of all time. Now, I'm not a competitive gamer, therefore I don't generally watch eSports tournaments. But that doesn't mean I devalue eSports and do not care about it. I think esports introduces more people to the gaming community and gives many a different perspective towards gaming as a sport. Sure, gaming is a waste of time, and so is living. Esports has value. People play games with skill and knowledge, and they win prizes like actual money. Sometimes tournaments can show info about upcoming games or just updates to already released games. So these kinds of video game tournaments can also be considered to be video game conferences like E3. I wish there was one now. Now enough about those. What does an esports tournament look like? Well, there are flashy lights, a big audience, a roster of competitive teams, and maybe some merch here and there. What I like about esports tournaments is that they're always hyped up by the audience. You can see that everyone is engaged in what's happening on screen. Video game conferences, they're either boring as hell, have mixed reactions from the audience, or have an audience like that one guy from the Podesta EJ 2019 conference. Yeah! Another thing that I like is the interactions between the two opposing players. They would roast each other for 10 minutes. Am I watching a rap battle right now? I'm not saying this happens constantly, but I like to imagine that it is. It's really awesome to see a rivalry spark between two players. It makes the tournament more fun and engaging. Now this is obviously a me thing, but I don't know a single person in any of these tournaments. I know some people here and there, but they're usually the more popular ones. I don't know anyone else in these tournaments. Not only do I not know the players, but I also don't know what this means. Yes, I don't know everyone and every team in any of these tournaments. You have every right to punch me, virtually. But there's one thing I know very vividly. One that haunts me to this day. MLG used to be the biggest meme on the internet for a time. Pretty much every video you see on YouTube during the early 2010s contains at least one bit of an MLG meme. All I knew about MLG back then was that it was just an organization for pro players, and that's true. But since this was pretty much used for trick shots back then, I just assumed this was something that's used for doing just that. Now MLG is still a thing today, though it died out in popularity due to the meme being overused around the early 2010s. So that's pretty much everything I knew about esports as a gaming competition. You can deny the fact that it may or may not be a real sport, but you cannot deny that esports requires actual skill and knowledge of a certain game. I don't normally enjoy competitiveness in video games, but I can at least appreciate the value of one. Alright, the tournament's about to start. I've been training for this my entire life. Actually, I just started training over a month ago. Anyway, the tournament's about to start, and I am going to win. I went to the wrong tournament. Oh hey, just when you thought it can't get any worse. It got worse! Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy is a platform video game developed by... Who? Bennett Foddy. Thank you.
So what is this game? How does it play? Well, it revolves around you controlling characters stuck in a large cauldron. You wield a long hammer which you can use to grip objects and move around. You try to move and progress through objects associated with difficult platforms and other stuff. And this is how you basically move throughout the entire game. You can only move using a mouse or a trackpad which can get incredibly exhausting in a long playthrough. There are no checkpoints in any part of the game which increases the risk of losing some of your progress, causing you to go all the way back down. So what else? Um, there's text and someone talks in this game. Thank you. The game was released on October 6, 2017 on Windows, two months later on Mac and iOS, Android on April 25, 2018, and on Linux around August 2018. So that pretty much wraps up everything about this game. The first reason I want to play this game is that it's difficult. The second reason is that it's part of my character arc. So let's play this game, and I promise I won't underestimate everything that this game has to offer. So we control our character by moving the hammer around. This portion of the game is more of a tutorial per se. It's pretty simple. We're off to a great start. Then we made it into this section, and this is where the game truly begins. This is the first real part of the game, and this is pretty much what the whole game is going to be. I mean, what else can I say? It's a physics-based game with obstacles. I could talk about it or just make a rage compilation like Markiplier. Either way, I'm not interesting at all, which means there's no reason for you to watch me in the first place. But here we are. We can only move using a mouse, and since this game is frustrating as hell, it can get pretty exhausting to move your arm around with the mouse but you can change the mouse sensitivity. I just use the default setting. There is not much strategy here, it all just depends on how fast you can move your mouse. Whenever you meet a new obstacle, you can pretty much take a risk and try to figure out how to get over it. But since I'm a good person and have nothing else to do, I will give you guys a guide to the entirety of the game. So here's my first tip. Don't. If you're listening to me, do not play this game. I've only reached this point because I've got nothing to do. So if you also got nothing to do, do something else other than play this game. So here's the real first tip. You can launch yourself by pointing your hammer to the ground then flick your mouse. Trust me when I say that this move will really help you. There are certain obstacles that you can't reach just by swinging your thong around. Just note that sometimes you launch far away and sometimes you don't. Next, when reaching these two parts, doing this can give you a slight jump. It'll bounce you to the other side and this is actually really useful to do when you're in either of these parts. So what's the next tip? Don't panic. When you fall or lose your progress, don't wiggle around. Sure, you may not control your anger when you lose progress, but when you try to rush back to where you were, you'll end up having another risk of losing more progress and starting all the way back here. This problem is the most prevalent when playing this game with a game that's sole purpose is to give you a headache, it's easy to lose your progress constantly. Now let's talk about the levels. In this part, you should swing by the branch. You can launch yourself and quickly grab the roof, but for me, it's easier to just swing by the branch. Once you make it to the barrels, launch yourself upwards and try to move the coffee away. If you do this, you can move on to this part. Now, this part is pretty tricky. There are multiple places for you to rest, but some of the rocks can get in the way of you moving on to the next area. I recommend staying on this spot, launching yourself upwards and quickly grabbing the ledge. You might need to do this a couple of times since this rock here can bounce you up once you launch yourself. Next there's this red steel thingy. You can either move to this spot or here, though this spot is riskier and you might fall off and start all over. This thing can slide you off but there's this little area here that you can grab onto. Then we move on to this area. This area will take a lot of tries. But if you remember that trick I told you earlier, this area will be a breeze. Now once you made it to the top here, be extra careful. You need to launch yourself to the right and quickly grab onto the ledge. It's easy to accidentally bounce off here, but it doesn't happen too frequently unless you're not being careful. Once you climb on top of this building, you need to grab onto this thing and swing yourself to the left. When you reach the end of the thing, there's this little gap that you need to be extra careful in this area because you might accidentally fall all the way down. Next, we have to be extra careful in this area because... Mm. The mountain seems no more a soulless thing, but rather as a shape of ancient fear. In darkness and the winds of chaos born amid the lordless heavens thundering, a presence crouched enormous and austere, 
before whose feet the mighty waters mourn. This area here is absurd. There are very few objects to grab onto and it's easy to fail at this part over and over. And it's right next to this area here. Once you made it to the boxes, just casually drop down here and quickly grab the boxes. I wouldn't recommend launching yourself because you might bounce off to the side here. Now we made it to the stairs. This part you're going to try a lot. It's easy to fall down here and it's difficult to progress through this area. But if you remember the trick we used in that one part, you can also use that trick here. There are many ledges here that you can grab onto, but there's very little area for you to do so. So slightly launch yourself upwards and swing your hammer to the right. You need to do this repeatedly. Once you made it, try to move yourself onto the tip of the chair. You want to be as close as you can to launch yourself towards the camera. You won't have any height once you launch, so quickly grab onto. Now try to move slightly to the right and launch yourself towards the couch. Again, you won't have enough height to reach it, so quickly grab onto it. Now this part isn't the trickiest, but I advise you to not want to rush this part. You've made a ton of progress at this point, so carefully and slowly make your way through this part. Now we made it to the orange. In this part, you have to be extra careful. It's easy to bounce off when you reach the rocks, and there aren't many platforms where you're safe. It's basically a 50-50 of you losing progress and progressing through this part. I would know that because if I didn't, I wouldn't have this footage here. Once you made it to the building, you still need to be careful here because you're nowhere near safe yet. You just need to launch yourself and grab onto the ledge here. And you need to do this twice with the next obstacle being this hand. There's very little room here so you need to be very careful when launching yourself upwards. Once you made it to the roof, launch yourself slightly to the right and try to grab onto this ledge here. Again, be careful. When you move over to the next area, you are safe now and the risk of going all the way down is gone. Then the next part is pretty easy. Stand on the hedge and launch yourself towards the roof of this house. I recommend you move this hat off the screen so that you have less stuff to worry about. When you reach the anvil, you have to move yourself to its very corner and launch yourself to grab onto the ledge. The ledge is pretty high up and this part will take a lot of tries. There's no room for failure here. If you fail, you just land next to the anvil. So take your time in this part. Then you have to launch yourself onto this floating rock. You have to be extra careful here because it's easy to fall off accidentally. You can't see where the next platform is, but if you move slightly down to the left, you can see where the next rock is. The next rock is much smaller, but this one is closer to the next platform at least. But if you fall down, you can see that it's actually a snowman. No reason to point this out, but I did, moving on. You have to do this a few more times until you eventually move to this part. Do not ride the snake. Do not ride it. Do not ever ride the snake. If you do, you're going to regret many things in life. This part may be the trickiest yet. You need to launch yourself and grab onto the bucket. Then swing gently so that you don't fall off. Let go and quickly grab onto the ledge here. It's easy to fall off if you're swinging a bit too hard. So be gentle when doing this part. Now when you made your way to the slope, you need to be careful as well. This part will take a lot of tries and you can lose a ton of progress if you fail. So once you made it here, be very careful. Try to rest here and launch yourself gently and swing your hammer to the right. After you climb this structure, you finally made it to the final obstacle of the game. The radio tower. All you need to do is to grab onto the radio dishes and try not to bounce off the side. It gets trickier the more you reach the top and the radio dishes get smaller every time. I advise you once more to be extra careful. If you fail, you will go all the way down and you will suffer as I have suffered. Once you made it to the top, launch yourself upwards and make your way through space. And that's the game. Why did I play this? Now that we got all of those out of the way, are there a few things to appreciate in this game? Well, I'm glad this game is pretty cheap, because if it weren't, you would be buying the greatest ripoff in video game history. I do like the randomness of the game. There are so many objects that appear in the game that have no business being in here. I mean, sure, it's a physics game, so it needs different objects for its obstacles, but still. Why is there a child here? The mouse being the only control method adds to the frustration of the game, so I think this game would also work well with a controller. I imagine it might be worse than using a mouse. Actually, I'm regretting this idea. Please, if any modders watch this, do not make a mod for this. I don't want to make another video talking about... Ben Fart. Though I hate this game with all my heart, I have to credit Barry Furry for making a game that's hell-bent on giving you the worst time of your life that makes you want to punch a child. It did its job well and that's at least something I could appreciate to something I deeply hate. Is it a good game? No. 
But looking at this game critically, maybe. My hatred for this game completely overpowers my will to critique this game justly. I don't know how to rate this game. So, maybe in a few years I'll look back at this game and give it a proper rating. I'm not gonna play it again, no, it's just that I couldn't rate it now. So let's see what my future self thinks about this game. I hate this. Oh hey, I'm just chilling, no big deal. You know, I'm feeling pretty good right now. No stress, no work, no Ninja Gaiden Tree. Let's get this over with. Ninja Gaiden Tree is the final installment in the Ninja Gaiden trilogy for the NES. For the NES. I'm never escaping this stupid franchise. Of course, this is the same side-scrolling platformer developed and published by Tech. It was released in Japan on June 26, 1991 for the Famicom and in North America in August for the NES. However, the NES version was never released in Europe. As much as I hate how Nintendo keeps restricting most of its products to Europe, I'm glad this is one of them. No one should ever suffer playing this game. Only people that don't have a living can play this game like me. But it did get a port later on to the Atari Lynx, a handheld by Atari. It was released in 1993 in Europe and in North America, with the European version retaining the North American title. So this is interesting. So the North American titles, obviously, have Ninja Gaiden as the title for the series. In Europe, however, the first two Ninja Gaiden games are called Shadow Warriors. Now, in the third entry, they decide to keep the same name for both North America and Europe. Why? I usually don't like changing titles to localize games for other regions, so if you're going to change the title for a third entry of a series that already has its own established name in a specific region, why even bother? That's like changing Avengers Infinity Ward into a Defenders Eternal Battle or something. Now while we're on the topic of titles, let's take a look at the box art. I don't like this. Let's compare the three box arts. The first one is alright, it's got a lot of tension going on in the background and there's a lot of fire which could imply that the game's telling you that what you're going to play is the literal definition of hell. The second I think looks much better. You got more story elements on the cover and it is overall pretty solid. This is just bland and empty. You only got Ryu on the cover and that's it. I mean, it's fine, it's serviceable. It's just that compared to the last two games, this is definitely the worst one. There aren't any story elements or anything that's happening in the background. I guess the cloud there represents the ancient ship of doom, but if it is, it doesn't even look close to the one we see in game. And we'll get there in a few moments because I got one more thing to whine about. It's said in Wikipedia, the best place for all your sources, that the North American version, which is the one that I played, was intentionally made harder than the Japanese version by the use of limited continues, stronger enemies, and the removal of a password system, which could have been so useful because while the game isn't too long, it's very hard. I mean, why? Why specifically the North American version? Why not do the same with the European version or even the Japanese version? What did the land of obesity do to deserve this? And why am I angry about this? I'm not even an American. Alright, this is it. Even though this is just the first of the many other games of Ninja Gaiden. Why am I being sentimental? I hate Ninja Gaiden. So we boot up the game and the cutscene plays, much like the previous two games. We see Irene getting chased by us, so this is what happens when you're a Minecraft YouTuber. Evil dialogue, Irene falls off cliff and dies. But that's just a theory. A game theory. We received the news and we headed to the laboratory where Irene was being chased, then the game starts. So, who's ready for me to lose it? So this is the first level. I hope you like industrial piping. We're inside the laboratory, and what the hell are these? So we got ninjas, obviously, and some robotic spiders. Apparently, they also got a mummy wearing a turtle shell for a hat and a floating marshmallow. One new feature you may have noticed already is the ability to hang overhead from surfaces. This is a really cool mechanic that should have been implemented more often today in platforming games. This ability is pretty useful whenever you're in a tight situation when you're surrounded by enemies. Doing this will give you just a bit amount of time to decide how to get out of situations like that. The problem is, is that in the later part of the game, most of the enemies fly out of nowhere and you're always guaranteed to get hit. Of course, the power-ups return. We get the same power-ups from the previous games, the boomerangs, the fireballs, and the fire wheel. 
but we get a new power-up that allows you to throw projectiles above and below you simultaneously. This power-up is really useful to me in the last few levels of the game, especially since most enemies come above and below you. One thing I notice is that more health potions pop up, especially the 1-ups, though they are more difficult to get by. Moving back to the first level, it's pretty easy in Ninja Gaiden terms. There are some parts where there are a ton of enemies, but overall, it's not a very difficult first level. And then we make it to the boss. Again, it's not that challenging. You just gotta time the attacks properly and when to dodge. But if you do get hit, you'll lose a ton of health, so be careful. And that's the first boss, easy. What do you mean this isn't an ordinary lab? They got Scyther and Baymax on crack. We then are greeted by a guy that's totally not creepy at all. He tells us to go to the Castle Rock Fortress. To get there, we'll have to get past all the traps our enemy has set up for us. When did they never? Alright, it's Act 2, and... No! It's a tradition to hate sand levels in video games. If you don't follow this tradition, are you even a gamer? So there are these areas that have quicksand and you slowly sink in if you stand still for a few seconds. All you have to do is to just jump around, but of course, it's Ninja Gaiden, and what do they have in store for us? Mummies for the watermelon for a head and alien frogs. I swear these frogs are so annoying. I jump and try to hit them, I get hit first. I crouch and try to hit them once they land, same thing. I stand still and try to hit them, the same thing happens again. And they drain your health bar if you don't kill them, I swear. These guys are probably one of the worst enemies throughout the entire series in the NES. And that's not all. There are these flying enemies that slowly get to you. While they're slow, they take up most of the space you're trying to get to. But compared to the frogs, these enemies are easier to kill since they move slowly. And also, what happened? It'd be nice if you put a pyramid there since the next stage takes place indoors, but no. You move to the right, next stage. There is no smooth transition here, unlike some parts in the game. Anyway, here's the next stage. We're somewhere on the ground and are introduced to this enemy. This guy has a shield, so you have to wait for them to attack so that they're vulnerable. This part of the level is the first one with tight spacing. There's always at least one enemy on a platform that you're trying to get to. We then enter this part where we run away from the lava. I really like this part. I still have to use save states here, but it's still far from difficult, though it's easy to mess up here. With the way Ninja Gaiden platforming works, it doesn't feel too slow or too fast. It just gives you enough time to take out enemies as you try to escape from the lava. But then again, it's easy to mess up here. We escape the lava and these things return from the second game. Great. Other than that, not much new stuff in this part, then we get to the second box. The boss flies around which is annoying and it flies up and down whenever it launches an attack. It does this upside down v-shaped attack which can be hard to dodge but all you need to do is to stay away from the boss's projectile range whenever it stops. The fight gets more frustrating if you use up your ninja meter to use your secondary weapons. Even if your ninja meter is full, the fight takes a lot of time to finish and it's easy to mess up here. But overall it's not the hardest boss fight so moving on. Cutscene plays and Foster. Oh, that guy from the first game. Where have you been? Why weren't you in the second game? And why do you have a red background? Oh. Alright, now we're in the spot. How do we get from there to here? Anyway, this level incorporates a ton of platforming that requires you to hang under them. Ignore that. There are these platforms that float up and down, and the majority of them float too down that you can instantly die from the water. What is the point of this? And there are these fish that just jump around. They're about as annoying as the frogs from the last level. The good thing is that they only appear at this level. The bad thing is they're everywhere here in this level. And then there are times when you have to hang over a vine to avoid an enemy, but there's always that one enemy that stays above the vine, and when you hang over it, you have no choice but to take damage. But this doesn't happen only in this level, it also happens in the following levels too. Just like, why? The enemy just touched my hand, how did it hurt me? So we enter in a, uh, where the hell am I? Like the previous games, the water pushes you here as well. Not much of a big problem, but can be a bit irritating in tight scenarios. There are also these spike balls that appear from above. They basically just follow you around and they can be pretty hard to dodge, but there's always your trusty wall by your side. 
We also have these blobs that throw projectiles at a curve on both sides. Again, these projectiles aren't the hardest to dodge, and they take time to charge. So, this entire area is a bit long and contains a ton of enemies, and all you have to do is to head to the very bottom. At the bottom, we have these frogs, though they don't move as fast as the ones in the last level. Other than that, I feel like they only appeared on this one level, so who cares about them. Next up, we have a lot of shit to tackle here. So let me show an image of this part of the level to summarize what you'll be dealing with here. Can you tell me what I had to go through? This is the first part that I spent a lot of time trying to get through. Even with save states, this stage is just dreadful because these things return all the time. From the first game, we have these birds. They're annoying, small, and they hit me most of the time and you can't even hit them. The same applies here, though this time they're bigger and they take up way too much space, and whenever I feel like I hit them first, I get hit first. This right here is the worst enemy in video game history yet. After that terror, we are greeted by the third boss of the game. Wait, let me just rephrase that. We are greeted by the third bosses of the game. They really like frogs. So we have to deal with these two frogs which apparently share the same health bar, which is good but man is it hard to dodge them. The shurikens that they throw at you are nearly impossible to dodge. And shortly after that, they jump around and you'll never know where they're going to land. Like the previous boss fight, this takes a while to finish. Primarily because the frogs move everywhere so fast that you don't even have enough time to deal some damage. This is the first boss fight I struggle with in this game and it took me like 12 minutes. That doesn't sound a lot, but given that you take a ton of damage by just a single hit, 12 minutes is a long time. After that, another cutscene plays, this time we met our clone, so we get a fight scene while the protagonist and the antagonist talk to each other. Typical anime stuff, but at least this one has a lot less stuff going on on screen so that there's time to read the subtitles. Unlike some animes, the fight begins, we lost. You're nothing but talk, aren't you? What do you mean, I'm you? I'll use the information from this fight the next time we meet. Okay, nerd, I got safe states. So we're, uh... Are we underground or at the top? Is that Baba in the background? Why are those mountains upside down? Where am I? Not much new stuff here. There are some parts where you need to time with the moving platforms. And this is where it kinda gets annoying. Remember those slow flying enemies from the second level? Well, this is where they truly become the third annoying enemy of the game. When trying to get to this platform, you have no choice but to lose health getting there unless you got the new power-up. But they spawn in a specific place depending on where you are, so you can just ignore some of them since they move slowly, but then again they take up a lot of space and you can get pretty hard to dodge them in a tight spot. But that's not all, we also got the flying bees! Same thing, but it's more annoying trying to hit them. Then we get inside the dungeon with spikes appearing and disappearing at a given time, they're easy to dodge in the first few stages, but they deal a ton of damage. There are these things that shoot projectiles in three different directions. Pretty easy to dodge, but it takes a while trying to hit them. So, don't even bother doing that. There's a lot more important stuff than these things. Overall, there's not much stuff in this part. You just gotta time your jumps, and there are times when enemies are in places where you can't hit normally, so you have to use some power-ups to beat them. Then we move to this section. Ever imagine what a Violet Galaga ship looks like? Here you go. They're pretty easy to kill using the right power-ups, but if you don't have any, you screw it up. These enemies move horizontally, either from the left or from the right, and they mostly move very slowly and move pretty fast when they like to. Just like the previous part, you just gonna time when you move and jump. The next part is pretty much the same, and then we get to the fourth boss. We're fighting Chestnut. So what does he do? Well, he walks towards you, drills underground, and throws fire at you. There's something funny about him going underground. The range of his fire attack is insane. It attacks five times and immediately after that, he jumps at you. But this guy is not the hardest boss. It's not that difficult to dodge a fire attack most of the time since you know that it's aiming at you. This fight is probably my favorite out of all the boss fights of the entire game, or maybe even the entire series in the NES mainly because it's not the most difficult, and for me, it's probably the only boss fight that I had fun playing through. Ew. I knew you'd come. Yuck. I remember you. I don't. Who the hell is Clancy? So Clancy tells us that he used to work for Foster and that he's secretly creating a Bionoid. To which we ask, what's a Bionoid? And he answered this, Good luck winning at who wants to be a millionaire. So Foster was rebuilding the fortress and doing some experiments. He's doing some evil stuff basically. 
quote-unquote cutscene. So we arrive at Castle Rock Fortress, i.e. the late 1700s. We got these robots that shoot projectiles by an arc. The attacks area is a bit wide but it's pretty easy to dodge them. But oh my god! So many bees, so many spider thingies, so many drones, there's so many! Right now, where are we? We got this guy that shoots the slowest laser beam in video game history. There's no way to deflect this attack, so you gotta crouch down. The problem here is if there are a bunch of enemies coming towards you and you crouch under the beam, you cannot move while crouching, so you're pretty much vulnerable when this happens. The moment you see this enemy pop up, try your best to kill him quickly. And this is something you want to do when you move to this part. There are a ton of enemies here, mostly the said enemies and those little things that jump around in this area. I recommend killing those guys first since if they shoot, you can't move around much. So just do that. Now we encounter Foster when Irene shows up. What? Our evil clone shows up, does a Dragon Ball Z move, and transforms into an evil purple Hulk. And this is by far the hardest boss fight yet. The boss jumps around, throws shurikens, and throws fireballs nearly at the same time. You're gonna spend a lot of time in this boss fight, and it's going to be more devastating when you realize you've spent so much time just trying to get to the boss fight. So when you run out of time, you go back here. The key to this boss fight is patience. Since the boss jumps around so much, you can't hit him most of the time. And he attacks often, so you need to be quick to dodge him. There's not much else to say here, it's just the fight takes so long to beat. So Clancy arrives, and what do you know, he's the real bad guy. He brought Foster with him and teleported to another dimension, I guess. So we followed him, and we entered this crystal cave. The platforms act like the ice from the previous game, so no explanation is needed here. And then... Am I in a mukbang video? So you might think that these are walls, well, they aren't. They just appear in the foreground, like why even put them here? You can't even discern it from the platforms around you. Honestly, they're pretty worthless. There's no reason to put them here. You're supposed to be dead. Who's that? Is that Goro from Mortal Kombat? Oh no, it's Scorpion. So this is a pretty simple fight. He shoots a fireball, charges at you, hits the wall, and stuff comes down. Overall, not a pretty difficult boss fight, so moving on. We got teleported and we meet Clancy, who now looks like Admiral Thrawn. What happened? The ancient ship of doom is summoned. And now we gotta stop it. We're playing Wing Fortress Zone in reverse. And... God damn! We got air again, it's still pretty annoying like the last title. Then we entered this area. Not much new in this area other than these electric fences that could literally kill you. Once we move to this part, I'm embarrassed to say how many times I tried this part. It's just that these moving platforms move so fast and the electric fences here provide you barely any space to jump around. So you just gotta time your moves properly. And then we entered this area, which is pretty long and pretty challenging. So moving on. Spikes. Fuck shit, fuck more spikes. Then we finally encounter Clancy one last time, who looks like a Gundam that tried to fuse with an insect. He convinces us to join him, and since we're the good guy, we refused, obviously. Now, this fight ain't the hardest. You can do a ton of damage if you use our power-ups at the start of the fight immediately, but eventually you lose energy to use them. So when you try to hit him normally with a katana, you hit him and you hit him once more because he'll stop moving when you hit him for the first time. Just try to dodge your projectiles, especially the lightning. Overall, not the hardest fight, but of course, this isn't the last boss fight. The second phase isn't too difficult as well. A bunch of projectiles come at the boss and charge up an attack that tracks you. This is his only attack here which makes this phase pretty easy. And then we make it to the final phase which acts like the same final phase from the previous games. He shoots a curved projectile and another projectile that bounces around. Sometimes this curved projectile is in the ground. I guess the attack depends on where you are vertically. There's barely any room here, so like that one boss from earlier, this fight will take you a while to beat. So once you hit him enough times, you just gotta hit the orb in his chest. And now he attacks sort of in a V-shaped pattern where he shoots lasers at you, and after just barely making it out alive, we beat the game. Yes! Finally! I've beaten the entire trilogy. That means I can rest. Well, no, we still got a couple of minutes left. So there goes the entire Ninja Gaiden trilogy for the NES. Definitely one of the best series of games for the system. 
It's full of action, has a good story, and looks pretty good for an NES game. However, it has its downsides. Obviously, these games are difficult, but not as much. Those who are new to these games might beat these games, and some might even find fun in these games. Pretty sure they belong in a isolation ward. The gameplay is unique. It's just a perfect combination of being fast enough for the modern gaming audience, but with just the right amount of clunkiness to make it feel like an NES game. The entire story of this series is nothing groundbreaking. Did you really expect this game to have a LEGO Marvel Super Heroes level of story quality? These games are from the 80s. It's not bad, but it's serviceable enough, and it's pretty much what you'd expect out of a video game about ninjas in the 1980s. As basic as the story is, it's actually quite good. Now, do I recommend playing these games? What have I been complaining about for 3 episodes? Nah, it's just that you can either tolerate these games or not. Just depends on you and your personality if you want to play the game. The only reason why I've been talking about games like this is to let everyone know that these kinds of games are the embodiment of suffering, but there's still good in them, which justifies the reason to want to play these games. And Ninja Gaiden is one of the many examples of that. I think I see it now. Even if my entire existence is based on complaining about stupidly difficult games, they're not actually that terrible. They're just terribly hard. But that's one of the reasons why they're good, and as you may already know, I reviewed the entirety of Ninja Gaiden, and it's good. It's pretty good. It's just hard. And by the entirety of Ninja Gaiden, I mean a third of the entire franchise. Ah! Oh, hey. What the f- Yeah, we've all seen this coming. Well, except that. Cuphead, the delicious last chorus. Huh, that's clever. Delicious last chorus, DLC. Well, I wish it gone deliciously immediately extinct. <laughs> On June 11, 2018, Studio MDHR released a brand new trailer announcing a DLC for Cuphead. No gameplay was shown here, but it did reveal some vital info about the DLC including a brand new playable character, Miss Chalice was already a character we knew in the game, a new location which means new bosses, weapons, and charms, and they also revealed a new character, Chef Saltbaker, who's totally not the main bad guy in the DLC, and it's announced to be released in 2019. After 3 more trailers, 2 announcing a port for the Switch and 1 for the Mac, we got another teaser trailer detailing the DLC. We only got less than 10 seconds of actual gameplay, okay, and it's now announced to hit on 2022 on all platforms. When this trailer hit, I was a bit worried. The last trailer about the DLC was released a year before, and up until the next DLC trailer was released, there was no new info till that point, and the new trailer didn't show anything at all besides some millisecond of gameplay. I mean, a delay can either go super wrong or not. The original game got announced around 2013, got two more trailers separately at E3 2014 and 2015, and got an announcement trailer in 2017. So given all of that, a few more delays would have been understandable. It just means that the people behind the development of the DLC would have more time. But alas, after nearly two years, it was finally released on June 30, 2022 on all platforms. Well that's a cool story bunch of delays back and forth to truly know if the game is worth it I gotta play it and given that I have played Cuphead before it shouldn't be that difficult so once you bought the DLC you are greeted with a new title screen nice diapers and once you enter your last save file, this guy comes and tells us to meet him on the coast. We meet him there and tells us that Chalice needs our help on an island for a mysterious discovery. So we head there with this cutscene. Uh, don't worry, he's not a bad guy here, he just smiles like that. Gosh, Cuphead, I, I don't know, I hope she's okay, we sure are far from home. So Chalice arrives, gives Mugman a cookie, and they switch places. And looking back at this part, she just killed Mugman. Follow Chalice and she says that she is trying to find a way to escape the astral plane. 
She introduces us to Chef Saltbaker, the greatest chef in all of the lands. Totally not the main bad guy here. Apparently, the cookie that Mugwen ate only has a temporary effect and Chalice returns to the astral plane. The chef, who's totally not the main bad guy, came up with a new recipe that will bring back Chalice to life. And the ingredients we need are held by the most fearsome of foes, so we'll be committing homicide. After the cutscene, we are given the astral cookie that allows us to play as Chalice. So this is the new island. If we come to this stand, we get a tutorial for Chalice. Unlike Cuphead and Mugman, Chalice can double jump, dodge roll, has an extra health point, and can parry dash. Basically, if you want this game to have an easy mode or just want to get on with a DLC, just play as Chalice. She also has her own set of unique abilities. Her Super Art 1 is the same as the regular one, but vertically. Super Art 2 gives you an extra HP, and Super Art 3 which just spawns a swarm of ghosts and a pink spirit that you can parry. So we head to the first boss of the DLC. The first phase has this big mafia spider. He walks around either from the tree levels while some of his goons shoot part at you. The spider would stop to either spawn a bunch of bombs, call some of his flies, or launch a caterpillar around the room. All of these attacks last a while so they can appear all at the same time. This phase is the hardest here but it's easy to mess up here. It can get pretty intense sometimes but it's easy to pick off those flies and if the bombs appear just dash in and out close to them to get rid of the bombs. I recommend watching out for those farts since you probably wouldn't even notice them most of the time because they don't appear that often. When transitioning to the second phase there are these bombs that walk around both at the top and the bottom. Sometimes one of them is pink which means you can parry them. But I wouldn't do that if I really have to. We got this lady that tip tapity dances around while the record players shoot out 6 musical sheets. When it's green it's safe to pass by it but when it turns yellow and red, it's best to avoid it immediately. Be warned about these guys since if you run away from the red laser beams, you might run into them. Also, sometimes the bombs from earlier can appear here so also be on the lookout for them. When the lady does her defeat animation, you can get hit if she does that. I restarted so many times because of this, it's pretty annoying that you can get hit by this. Then we enter the final phase where we will be fighting a giant anteater. Once it does this animation, you can hit the snail to get a couple of hits in. This phase is pretty tricky. You can tell from which side the anteater is about to attack, but you can't tell exactly where it will be attacking. It can attack from the top, the middle, or the bottom. Most of the time, it will fake out its attack where it uses its tongue to grab a bunch of flies, which then becomes a new projectile that bounces around, making it harder to dodge any incoming attack. The only way to deal damage is if you hit its mouth. It's easy to get hit here because you might accidentally get hit immediately by its mouth, which is the only place where you can deal damage. They could have just made the entire anteater exposable so that you can hit the anteater and just make the anteater's health bigger so that the fight will last longer. So after that, we beat the boss. Oh, uh, never mind, there's another. Uh, okay, after we beat the first boss, we gain access to this area where we fight the next boss a literal cowboy. <laughs> This is the first DLC boss where you fight in a plane. In the first phase, there are multiple things to be on the lookout. We got the boss's main attack where he shoots a snake oil that comes back in the same direction they were shot. Sometimes the cowboy pulls out a cactus either from the top or the bottom. There are these birds that throw dynamite and when it explodes, it lets out multiple dynamites as well. There are also these flying horses that appear either above or below where they shoot out a cactus ball before they leave the screen. This phase isn't too hard, you just have to be on the lookout for the projectiles since there are so many of them. In the second phase, he lets out the vacuum that sucks stuff coming off screen. Afterwards, he shoots out bolts that when they hit the ground, they shoot out gold and money. Like the last phase, you just have to be on the lookout for the projectiles. It's easy to dodge them if you know what you're doing, and I would recommend parrying the pink or gold since it's pretty easy to parry them. Then in the next phase, he gets sucked by his own vacuum and becomes a living sausage. This phase might be the hardest one in this fight in my opinion. The meat he shoots out can be hard to dodge, especially with these flying cans of beans that take up a lot of space. The best thing to do here is to not panic. Finally, in the last phase, he becomes a can of sausages and he lets out a row of sausages that float up and down in a sideways V shape where there are these gaps in between where you can dodge the attack. While this is happening, a bunch of jalapenos are spread throughout the area. This phase is tricky, you just gotta focus on the gaps between the sausages to avoid them, as well as the flying jalapenos. Overall, a pretty solid boss fight, just not the hardest one. 
beating this boss unlocks a new area where we fight a bunch of furries, the worst monsters out there. Before we do that, there's this old ghost who's on a mystery. Apparently, he said that there must be an order or method to access the astral plane in this graveyard here. And we'll come back to that soon, because right now, we gotta deal with- So here's the first phase. We got this bulldog that either grabs a cat and he shoots out 3 yarn balls, or he shoots out 3 bones that are coming out of his tattoo. Uh, don't even mention how he does that. There are prompts to determine which attack he'll be doing. It's easy to dodge your bones, but when it comes to the yarn balls, if you're playing as Chalice, double jump and dash towards the direction they were shot from. It's easy to dodge these if you're playing as Chalice. You also got these little guys that throw tennis balls. There are also fire hydrants that chase you around. With the fact that you have to move left and right to get the plane to tilt around, it can get pretty hard to dodge if all of these attacks happen all at once. Also take note that you can fall out of the plane and get hit, so you don't have a lot of room to move around and not get hit. In the next phase, 4 dogs in jetpacks fly around you in circles shooting letters at you. It's easy to dodge the projectiles and overall this entire phase is the easiest here, but you just gotta time your jumps properly when you're trying to avoid your projectiles. Once you made it to the final phase, you just gotta avoid the lasers, pretty standard stuff. Then this happens. It's a good thing I'm using a laptop. So this part you're going to be really careful about. Since the screen is tilted, your controls change as well. There are only two attacks here. The lasers from earlier only appears when the screen is normal, and the dog balls. Red means that they fly at the ground level, so you have to jump, and the yellow flies above you. The only way you lose here is if you messed up. This entire phase is pretty confusing, but after a few attempts, it, it can get pretty easy to understand the entire phase, but it's still easy to mess up. Beating this boss unlocks a new area where we fight the Ice King. The first phase is pretty easy. The boss floats around at the top, which makes it pretty easy to deal some hits. He would spawn in a bunch of icicle clones, shoot out a bunch of cards, and smack you with a whale. The next phase is a bit difficult. He becomes a giant snowman, and after he transforms, he'll roll up to you and there are two variations of this attack. Either he rolls normally or jumps at you. And then he would become a giant refrigerator that shoots out ice cubes that when they hit the ground, they spawn in more ice cubes. The refrigerator also lets out flying popsicles, and they can get pretty hard to dodge especially when the snowman is readying another attack. It's where the popsicles just appear while you're trying to dodge away from the snowman, and it's annoying. The snowman also has this one attack where he smacks the ground, a bunch of swords appear one by one. Finally, when you reach the final phase, the snowman becomes a giant floating snowflake, and there are these platforms that float around in circles. The giant snowflake would move from the opposite side whenever it feels like it. This guy's got multiple attacks. First is this eyeball that shoots lasers vertically, second are these ice beams, and lastly there are these buckets that split into three moon projectiles. This fight isn't the hardest, but it's easy to mess up here. Overall, not the hardest boss fight yet. Beating this boss unlocks another way to the gnome giant. There's a ton of stuff here in the first phase. There are 5 platforms here that go up and down. You can go down to where the gnomes are, but most of the time, if you do, you might get hit by them. Normally, the gnomes throw fireballs at you, which are pretty easy to dodge. The gnome giant would open its mouth and the cauldron inside would launch a bunch of clouds at you. It would also grab a bear towards him, which is pretty easy to avoid. It gives you less room to avoid projectiles. Then, in the second phase, he grabs two dolls that shoot out projectiles aimed at you. This phase is pretty easy overall, but then we get to the final phase. The giant ate us and now we're inside his stomach. We just gotta shoot upwards while also avoiding any attacks and the disappearing platforms. If you parry one of the skulls' tongues, the platforms restart and they all appear once again. And you have to do this constantly while also avoid incoming attacks. This phase isn't the hardest, but it's easy to mess up here. There's not enough room to double jump. Most of the time, you might accidentally get hit by the boss or fall into the acid pool. Overall, it's not that difficult. So, we murdered all of them and got our ingredients, now it's time to give these to the chef, who's totally not the main bad guy in this game. Okay, this is new. Must have let this open. Oh, who would have seen this coming? So he basically sent us to murder an entire mafia, Clint Eastwood, a bunch of furries, purple PJs, and a giant gnome just to help him in his evil plan, and now he trapped Cuphead inside a jar. It's a chef, he can't be that hard to beat.
I swear, this damn cook put up more of a fight than the devil. The devil. So in the first phase, he does a lot of attacks. Firstly, there's this fireball that goes up and down that follows you where you are. This attack's not much of a deal, but it can be annoying at times. Secondly, there are these slimes that spin around the area. They're pretty annoying, but they're easy to avoid if you're really being cautious. Third, there are these sugar cubes that float up and down. They're also annoying, but I would recommend trying to parry the pick ones. You'll have less time worrying about avoiding any other incoming attacks if you do. Lastly, there are these biscuits in the form of animals that jump around. It's easy to accidentally get hit by them, but if you use the spread attack, they won't be much of a problem. Every time you restart the fight, the chef starts with either of the two attacks, the spinning limes or the sugar cubes. This phase is the longest here, which means this phase might be the hardest yet. If you want to beat the boss, you might need to use the super art that gives you an extra hit point. Trust me when I say that this is really useful. It's easy to mess up in this entire boss fight, so you might need to use the super art. If you're going to do that, you just need to save your super meter in the latter half of the first phase. It might take a while, so be very patient. In the next phase, there are four pepper shakers. You need to deal enough damage for the pepper shaker to attack the chef. This is the only way you can damage the chef in this phase. The pepper shaker sneeze out peppercorns, some of which can be parried. You also need to look out for this flaming guy. He jumps around to where you are so be careful. Be aware of the falling leaves. If this happens, it might get difficult to avoid any attack. Overall, not the hardest phase, but still easy to screw up. In the third phase, the chef is destroyed and he sends out a clone that jumps around the screen. The clone is pretty big and has a white hitbox, so whenever it is close to you, just dash out of the way. And also be aware of this little saw in the ground. This phase is short, but you have to be really careful not to dash into the clone since that might happen by mistake. Finally, we're in the last phase. The chef turns into two salt tornadoes and his heart bounces around the area. Now in this phase, you have to be extra careful. There's very little area here and it's easy to get hit by anything. The platforms fall downward so you have to jump constantly. Because of all this, you can get hit by the floating heart since it moves up and down and left and right. So here's my strategy, just wait for the heart to float at the top. By then you can deal some hits because it's pretty difficult to hit it if it's down here. While you're doing this, you need to jump to get to the other platforms. So you just gotta aimlessly point your gun at the top and just look at the bottom to jump to the other platforms. If the heart moves at the bottom, just try to get to the top to not get hit. You might need to parry the heart if you need to. By the way, when you parry the heart, it cannot take damage for a few seconds, so be patient. Before this phase, I advise that you need to save up a full super meter in case you lose the extra hit point. This entire boss fight is the hardest boss fight in the entire game. As I said earlier, this chef put up more of a fight than the freaking devil. In comparison between these two fights, I'd say the chef is easily a better boss. This doesn't mean the devil boss fight isn't that hard, no. I also spent a lot of time beating that guy. It's just that I spent more time trying to beat this guy than him. But the devil's boss fight feels like the final boss. He spent hours beating up everyone to beat up the devil, and that felt rewarding. With how short of time you need to beat the main quest of the DLC, the chef's boss fight doesn't feel as rewarding as the devil's. But this fight is still rewarding nonetheless. I feel like there's a lot of variety here in the boss fight when it comes to the attacks. Especially in the first phase, all of the attacks have very different and vibrant colors. That's pretty much all the good stuff I have to say about this guy. I freaking hate this chef. The bakery collapses, the chef goes to court, where he is sentenced to community service. What? He deserves to be in hell. I had to spend 3 hours just trying to beat this guy. He deserves first and community service. Oh, and now look, he rebuilt the bakery and threw a feast. He's going to poison everyone in this town. Wait, who's that guy? Ah, oh, shit, the game's not over. This is the king's sleep. This guy here is the king, and he has a bunch of challenges for us. So how these challenges work is that you can't use your weapons or your charms. Instead, you have to parry to deal some damage. Don't worry, these bosses aren't the hardest, but they aren't the easiest as well. It'll take some time to learn the bosses since they all function differently. So let's go through all of them. First, we have these pawns. We just have to parry their heads and then move on. Do note that the parry pawns can still run around so you have to avoid them. Second, we have this knight. Probably the second hardest boss in the king's sleep, but it's not that difficult at all. You just gotta be patient for him to be vulnerable, and you have to learn his moves so you can telegraph what he's about to do. 
You can pray him twice, maybe even three times if you do it immediately, after he does a move and if you time it properly. Next we got this bishop whose heads float around. You must blow out the lit candles by going through them so that you can parry the bishop. If the bishop's heads disappear, don't stay near to the middle. And there are also these bells that float around the area. They're not much of an issue but they can be pretty annoying. Next we have this executioner. He spawns a bunch of pink heads, skulls, and sparks. You need to parry the pink heads constantly so that they can hit the executioner. In this entire fight, you just have to be patient. It can be difficult to parry the pink heads since you'll risk getting close to the executioner, but overall it's not that hard. Finally, we have the queen. You have to parry the pink sparks on these cannons. They aim around a lot so you have to time your parries properly. You also gotta react very quickly when she spawns in these pink statues. They're pretty fast and they spawn real quick, so parry them as fast as you can. She also throws a bunch of trinkets that spread around the area. They're pretty hard to avoid, so be on the lookout for them. Sometimes when you parry the cannon and it shoots, it avoids the queen which is pretty annoying. But the fight isn't that long, and that's pretty much about it for the king's sleep. After every boss, you are rewarded with 2 coins. When you beat the queen though, you get 3 coins. After you beat the entirety of the king's sleep, it now becomes a training ground. But is the game over? Not yet. We still got one more mystery, and that is the graveyard. So if you talk to the old ghost, he says that there must be a pattern that can unlock something in the graveyard. To get your clues, you need to talk to the winners on the podium next to the place where you fought the giant gnome. The clues are randomized for every, so you need to deduct very carefully what the winners say. For example, if you talk to the winner in the first place, they'll give you a hint and you'll have to use that hint to find the first tombstone that you'll have to interact with. And you'd have to do that with the second and third place winners. You're gonna spend a lot of time trying to figure out these clues. There's not much I can help with here since it's randomized for everyone, so just take your time trying to find out the pattern. Once you find out the pattern, the middle tombstone lights up and all you need to do is to take a nap. I wonder what's gonna happen. You? Why are you here? So we're fighting both the angel and the demon. This boss fight is short but it's still quite difficult. The demon will always face the player while the angel will always be behind you. That just gave a whole new meaning. The angel's attacks don't do anything, but when the two switch sides, the angel's attacks turn into the demon's attacks, which deal damage. There's also this cloud that shoots lightning at the bottom. The cloud isn't much of a problem, it can actually help you get out of sticky situations if you plan it carefully. The demon shoots fireballs and a wall of fire. The only way you can dodge the wall of fire is if you look at the opposite side so that the walls turn into water. Another way you can dodge the wall is if you equip the charm that allows you to dodge through the attacks. But if you equip this charm, you, you can play as Chalice. And I recommend that you do this. You can beat this fight as Chalice, but I think it's easier if you do this instead. I recommend you use the crack shot so that you don't have to worry about not aiming at the demon. And if you do all that, you beat the boss. Like I said multiple times in the past, a chef took a lot longer to beat than the demon. And that's about it for the DLC. Honestly, I was expecting a bit more. It's a pretty short expansion if you look back at it. It only has bosses, no run gun levels or anything, and it's pretty weird because while Cuphead is known for its notorious bosses, the run and gun levels are quite challenging as well and it's bizarre that there's none of that here. The bosses though are great, there may not be a ton of them here, but all of them leave a great impression. They're all pretty unique and that's what makes them quite memorable. The King's Deep is also a nice little bonus, a bunch of short mini bosses that reward you with a bunch of coins, I'm guessing this is their replacement for the run and gun stages. They're short and not that challenging, but it was a fun time. I just wish there was a bit more. And the hidden boss fight, the angel and the demon, it was a bit underwhelming. The damn puzzle took me longer to beat than the actual fight itself. It's nice that the devil returned, but the fight itself wasn't that difficult. It's not easy as well, no, but I expected it to be very difficult. So that's the entirety of Cuphead. I can't say it's the hardest game of all time, but it sure gave me a migraine. So I hope I no longer return to this game for some stupid reason like completing this game 100%. You know what? I think I might do that.
You know what? No. Please. I think I might be. Please. Oh, God. My president is such an idiot. Uh, there's only one way to prevent this. Uh, what is it now? Yeah! Listen, this is important. Oh, it's you. Look, I've told you for the last time to stop giving me Burger King onion rings. I had them every day for nearly a year. My present self wants to play Cuphead and complete it 100%. And you know what happens if it does. So you called me to save a different version of you. Why would I do that? Um, well, what do you want? Other than the Burger King onion rings, that is. My own fucking episode. Are you sure? Why was it not destroyed with the rest of their fleet? When you first saw Halo, were you blinded by its majesty? Paralyzed? Dumbstruck? Yet the humans were able to evade your ships, land on the sacred ring and desecrate it with their filthy footsteps. There will be order in this council. You were right to focus your attention on the flood. But this demon, this master chief... Long enough. Make an example of this bungler. The council demands it. You are one of our most treasured instruments. Long have you led your fleet with honor and distinction. But your inability to safeguard Halo was a colossal failure. Soon the great journey shall begin, but when it does, the weight of your heresy will stay your feet, and you shall be left behind. was about to fail. There's viscosity throughout the gel layer. Optics, totally fried. And let's not even talk about the power supply. You know how expensive this gear is, son? Do I look like I give a damn? So, Johnson, when you gonna tell me how you made it back home in one piece? Sorry, guns. It's classified. <laughs> My ass? Well, you can forget about those adjustments to your A2 scope and your... Well, he's in a particularly fine mood. Maybe Lord Hood didn't give him... Look, I appreciate all this, but I gotta do something else. You see, I gotta save this guy who is more of an idiot who wears glasses. <laughs> Haven't seen it in Are you even listening to me? And every time I try to talk, everyone ends up changing the subject. You told me you were gonna wear something nice. You see? Folks need heroes, Chief, to give them hope. So smile, would ya? Well, we still got something to smile about.
Gentlemen, we're lucky to have you back. Go ahead, Cortana. Another whisper, sir, near Io. We have probes en route. Uh, I apologize, but we're going to have to make this quick. You look nice. Uh, please. Sergeant Major, the Colonial Cross is awarded for acts of singular daring and devotion. For a soldier of the United Earth Space Corps, Commander Miranda Keyes, your father's actions were in keeping with the highest traditions of military service. His bravery in the face of impossible odds reflects great credit upon himself and the UNSC. The Navy has lost one of its best. Slip space ruptures directly off our battle cluster. Show me. Fifteen Covenant Capital ships holding position just outside the kill zone. We are engaging the enemy. Negative, Admiral. Form a defensive perimeter around the cluster. Commander, get to your ship. Link up with the fleet. Yes, sir. You have the Mac gun, Cortana. As soon as they come in range, open up. Gladly. Something's not right. Hey, where the fuck's my award? I'm invited. Where is it, you fucking sure, pussies? Boarding craft and lots of them. They're going to try to take our Mac guns offline. Give their capital ships a straight shot at Earth. Master Chief, defend this station. Clef, not Chief. My award. Right this way. Well, this doesn't look like an award, but I love guns. Oh, I can dual wield. Trees in a military outpost. Who the fuck is running this military? Jesus Christ! This is where all my taxes go. Whoa. What the hell? Oh wow, yeah, that's a great strat. Jump into an open area while green tin can mows you down with your own weapons? Yeah, I think that's effective. Ah, Jesus Christ, that's a lot. Oh, Jesus. Oh, don't mind if I do. Alright, now where's the last guy? Oh, there you are. Where are you going? Get over here. Oh, you're not dead. There you go. Never mess with an idiot. Still alive! Sir, orders have breached the fire control center. They have a bomb. Can you defuse it? Yes, but I'll need the chief's help to make contact with the dead. First echelon, you're with chief, me. Find get to the bomb. Double tap. You god fucking damn it. I literally have plot armor and I keep getting called Master Chief. Grow a brain cell, you fucking idiots. Me, inside your head, now. Now that you're inside my head, what do you think about my... You don't want to know. Cairo, this is an emberclad. The carrier shield is down. I'm in position and ready for immediate assault. Negative, Commander. Not against a ship that size. Not on your own. Sir, permission to leave the station. For what purpose, Master Chief? To deliver a badass cutscene. Permission granted. <sighs> I gotta do all this and save before I mention. I know what you're thinking, and it's crazy. What? I like crazy. Unfortunately for us both, I like crazy. Well, shit. Just one question. What if you miss?
Gear up. We're taking this fight to the surface. Any idea what it means? Dear humanity, we regret being alien bastards. We regret coming to Earth. And we most definitely regret the Corps just blew up our raggedy ass fleet. Hoorah! Regret is in vain, Sergeant. The name of one of the Covenant's religious leaders, a prophet. He's on that carrier, and he's calling for help. <laughs> Immediate. Grid Kilo 2-3 is hot. Recommend mission abort. Roger, Recon. It's your call, Sergeant. We're going in. Get tactical, Marines! Mr. Chief, get aboard that carrier. Secure the Prophet of Regret. This is the only place on Earth the Covenant decided to land. That Prophet is going to tell us why. Whoa. Links up to the bridge. It's full of rats, if you know what I mean. But it beats swimming. What do you mean? This looks cleaner than all of the tunnels in my country. The future's great. They reincarnated Danny DeVito. Hell yeah! Good thing you guys aren't complete idiots like the last ones. You guys are competent, and they weren't. Like, what? What are you doing? You fucking trick! on the earth. That bite dude needs to chill. Jesus Christ, just explode already! Uh, finally! Uh, I see the light. Uh, this underground tunnel is too fucking long. Right through us. 50k. 
shell, rockets, didn't do a thing. I like to write that. Where's the rest of your platoon? Wasted, Sarge. And we will be too, sir, if we don't get the hell out of here. You hit Marine. N no, sir. What about that scare? Then listen up. You had your chance to be afraid before you joined my beloved corps. But to guide you back to the true path, I brought this motivational device. Our big green style cannot be defeated. What about the that chief scare? is gonna jump in this tank. Roll across the bridge and blow up any inhuman son of a bitch dumb enough to get between him and the prophet of regret. Pull yourself together, because you're going with it. What about when that? I joined the Corps, we didn't have any fancy schmancy tanks. We had sticks, two sticks and a rock for a whole platoon. And we had to share the rock. What about that? Fuck up, boy. You're one very lucky Marine. What about that? Scare? Usually the good Lord works in mysterious ways, but not today. This here is 66 tons of straight up H E spewing divine intervention. If God is love, then you can call me Cupid. What about what the fuck? Stay with the master chief. Happened. We'll know what to do. What about that? Thanks scare? for the tank. He never gets me anything. What about that? Oh, I know what the ladies like. Damn it, I can't fit the tank. Well, I could use some exercise. I had too many fucking on your rings. Who the fuck's driving the Puma over there? Two ghosts? Ah, uh, well, suck my two plasma balls. Return to an amberclad. Roger that. Status. Sir, the prophet is bugging out. Request permission to engage. Negative, Commander. All vector two heavies for star side intercept. Ma'am, lift space rupture off the target's bow. It's going to jump inside the city. There's no time, sir. Green light. Green light to engage. Punch it. Get us close. Ma'am, without a destination solution, we are not losing that ship.
Roger Cold. I'll need to rekey the system. Do it and find out where we are. Sorry for the quick jump, Sergeant. You in one piece? I'm good. Yeah. Chief? We're fine. Ma'am, there's an object coming into view now. Cortana, what exactly am I looking at? That is another halo. <laughs> Say what? So this is what my father found. I thought Halo was some sort of super weapon. It is. If activated, this ring will cause destruction on a galactic scale. Wait, I want the thing I need to save that virgin is somewhere there. Uh, what a perfect coincidence. Everyone. I don't care if I have the clearance or not. Yes, ma'am. Where's our target? The enemy ship has stopped above the ring, ma'am. We're going to pass right over it. Perfect. Given what we know about this ring, it's even more important that we capture the Prophet of Regret. Find out why he came to Earth, why he came here. Chief, take first platoon. Hard drop. Secure landing zone. Sergeant, load up two flights of pelicans and follow them in. Aye, aye, ma'am. Until I can move and fight, I'm going to keep a low profile. Once you leave the ship, you're on your own. I told you to stop that. Over the target, in five. Hang on to your helmet. I understand the Prophet will need an object, the Index, to activate the ring. I've located a library similar to the one you found on the first Halo. If the rings work the same way, the Index should be inside. I'll bet the Covenant are thinking the exact same thing. Then we better beat them to it, Sergeant. Extract your men and meet me at the library. Yes, ma'am. I'll secure the Index, Chief. One more chore to receive that no life for all the intel we need. Enemy. Where? Why am I aiming with a sword? Alright, men. We're going on a little field trip. I haven't had a 
few trips since Reach. I really miss that planet. Especially Jerry. No wait, is that Joe? Fucking flies! Come on, it's fucking October! Wakey wakey, Toblerones! This thing likes anything but a hole. Dude, there's two hunters and I'm out of ammo. Hey, thanks man. Another field trip. Hopefully there ain't any more flies. Where in the fred fuck hit me? If it wasn't you, give me that. What hit me? Ah oh, fuck, the flies are evolving! What the fuck is with the music? I'm just walking. See them? They're already dead. Well, except for that guy. I think. There are no more and then... That's the largest Covenant fleet I've ever seen. You said that I'll before they appeared. You're seen. fucking crazy. Get inside the temple and kill regret before it can stop us. I'm not even gonna bother. Boom! This has got terrible security against rockets. Oh, wait, is that? It's a foreskin alien. Boom! Boom! Come here! This is why I got circumcised. Ah! <laughs> come here, man. All right, come here. Your boss is dead, and now you're getting the promotion. This is a good day for you. I'm never watching Independence Day ever again. Fuck, 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 fuck. Yeah. Superhero landing. Dude, this is the slowest laser beam ever in history. How am I running this shit? swore to uphold the covenant even through our dying breath those who would break this oath are heretics worthy of neither pity nor mercy even now they use our lord's creations to broadcast their lives we shall grind them into dust and continue our march to glorious salvation This armor suits you, but it cannot hide that mark. You are the Arbiter, the will of the Prophets. But these are my elites. Their lives matter to me, yours does not. 
Sacrifice us all for nothing. More questions? Splendid. I would be happy to assist you.
This is unprecedented. Unacceptable. The Hierarch is dead, Commander. His murderer was within our grasp. If you had not withdrawn our phantoms... Are you questioning my decision? No, Holy One. I only wish to express my concern that the brutes... Recommissioning the Guard was a radical step. But recent events have made it abundantly clear that the Elites can no longer guarantee our safety. I shall relay your decision to the Council. Do you know, Arbiter, the Elites have threatened to resign, to quit the High Council, because of this exchange of hats? <coughs> These are trying times for all of us. Even as the human's annihilation filled us with satisfaction, the loss of one of the sacred rings racked our hearts with grief. Putting aside our sorrow. We renewed our faith in the prophecy that other rings would be found, and see how our faith has been rewarded. Halo! Its divine wind will rush through the stars, propelling all who are worthy along the path to salvation. But how to start this process? For ages we searched for one who might unlock the secrets of the rings. An oracle. And with your help, we found it. With appropriate humility, we plied the Oracle with questions, and it, with clarity and grace, had shown us the key. You will journey to the surface of the ring and retrieve this sacred icon. With it, we shall fulfill our promise. Salvation for all! And begin the great journey. Once the shield is down, We'll head straight to the library. I do not wish to keep the Hierarchs waiting. <coughs> Who do you think? <coughs> Why? Looking for a little payback? <coughs> of course. Have you not considered the fact that you ordered on Amazon? Of all places? <coughs> We shall cut into the heart of this infestation, retrieve the icon, and burn any flood that stand in our way. The parasite is not to be trifled with. I hope you know what you're doing. Bro, what the fuck? On your way, Arbiter. 
I'll deal with these beasts. <laughs> You know, your father never asked me for help either. The index is secure. Mackenzie, Perez, how's our exit? You hear me, Marines? We got trouble. And I am the prophet of regret, counsel of most high, high arc of the covenant. A reclaimer? Here? At last. We have reclaimer? To do. This facility must be Dude, I got PTSD just coming from you right now. I don't want to talk about that library. be done until my sermon is complete. Not true. This installation has a successful utilization record of 1.2 trillion simulated in one actual. It is ready to fire on demand. Of all the objects our lords left behind, there are none so worthless as these oracles. They know nothing of the great journey! And you know nothing about containment. You have demonstrated complete disregard for even the most basic protocols. This one's containment. And this one's great journey are the same. Your prophets have promised you freedom from a doomed existence. But you will find no salvation on this ring. Those who built this place knew what they wrought. Do not mistake their intent, or all will perish. As they did before. Tentacles is right. The Halo Onion Rings were a bad idea to begin with. Your people are making a big mistake. Ma'am! You really are retarded. If you will not hear the truth, then I will show it to you. There is still time to 
to stop the key from turning. But first it must be found. You will search one likely spot. And you will search another. Fate had us meet as foes. But this ring will make us brothers. We are, all of us, gravely concerned. The release of the parasite was unexpected, unfortunate, but there is no need to panic. In truth, this is a time to rejoice. A moment that all the Covenant should savor. For the sacred icon has been found. With it, our path is clear, our entry into the divine beyond guaranteed. The great journey is nigh, and nothing, not even the flood, can stop it. Journey waits for no one, brother. Not even you. Counselors, are they? Violence, loyal beasts. The prophets were fools to trust them.
this one was started. And this time, none of you will be left behind. One lock. A chest. That structure in the center of the city, it's a forerunner ship. Yeah, no kidding. And Truth is heading straight for it if he leads the Covenant fleet to Earth. They won't stand a chance. You have to stop him. King Kong's got a plot device. And the commander in Johnson. He can end Halo 2 on a cliffhanger. If he does, I'll detonate in Amberclad's reactor just like we did the Autumns. The blast will destroy this city and the ring. Not a very original plan, but we know it'll work. No, I don't want to chance a remote detonation. I need to stay here. Make a girl a promise, if you know you can't keep it. I don't know what that means. I never touch a girl. <laughs> Where the counselors were meant to watch the consecration of the icon. The start of the great journey. There is still time to stop the key from turning. <laughs> then mount up, Arbiter. I know a way to break those doors. <laughs>
easy. Take the icon in your hands and do as you are told. Please use caution. This reclaimer is delicate. One more word, Oracle, and I'll rip your eye from its socket. Mm. Which is nothing compared to what I'll do to you. <laughs> Put it down, and disobey the Hierarchs. Take care, Arbiter. What you say is heresy. Not another word. Please, don't shake the light bulb. If you want to keep your brain inside your head, I tell those boys to chill. Go ahead. Do your thing. Weapons of last resort, built by the forerunners to eliminate potential flood hosts, thereby rendering the parasite harmless. After exhausting every other strategic option, my creators activated the rings. They and all additional sentient life in three radii of the galactic center died as planned. Would you like to see the relevant data? Yes, yeah, I it. I am a No, Arbiter. The great journey has begun. And the brutes, not the elite, shall be the prophet's escort. What's that? A beacon. What's it doing? Communicating at superluminal speeds with the frequency Communicating of... with what? The other installations. Show me. Failsafe protocol. In the event of unexpected shutdown, the entire system will move to standby status. All remaining platforms are now ready for remote activation. Remote activation? From here? Don't be ridiculous. Listen, Tinkerbell, don't make me... Then where? Where would someone go to activate the other rings? Why the Ark, of course. <laughs> Isolate that signal. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing on that ship? Sir, finishing this episode in a cliff hanger. Sir. 
all right. Shoot. I can't say it's the hardest game of all time, but it sure gave me a migraine. So I hope I no longer return to this game for some stupid reason, like completing this game 100%. You know what? I think I might do that, but I think I might need to break it to do that first. So I'm going to be productive. I can't just sit here and talk about all things gaming. I need to make a living. Oh, hey, um, I made a mistake. Um, apparently a child bought the game and it showed Steve Harvey in bikini, so I guess this is the part where I talk about Xbox Live instead. Xbox Live, now known as the Xbox Network, why is an online multiplayer gaming and digital media delivery service created and operated by Microsoft themselves for the Xbox? As Microsoft developed the original Xbox, online gaming was one of their main objectives for the Xbox strategy. Back then, the only form of multiplayer was to have one or more people play with you under the same roof, with multiple controllers, on the same console, and on the same TV screens. That is, unless you count PC games, but let's just stick to this generation of gaming for now. More specifically, the consoles in this generation. The Xbox Live was the second online gaming service to launch, and to have also lasted quite a while, with the PS2's online service launching first, however the PS2 itself didn't initially ship with built-in network capabilities. Sega and Nintendo attempted to jump into this trend too, though their online services weren't as successful compared to the Xbox and PS2. SegaNet was an internet service geared for online gaming on the Dreamcast, which discontinued less than a year later after the console's release and shutting down its servers two years later. The GameCube barely had any games with internet functionality, half of which required either having to buy their official broadband or modem adapter to play games over the internet or games that have LAN support. Microsoft, however, hoped that the Xbox would succeed where others have failed. They want this online gaming service to not only allow for downloadable content to be downloaded quickly and stored, but also to make it possible for features like voice communication and the like. This hasn't been done before by any other competitors during and before this generation of gaming. So this could increase the console's sales, luring in gamers who want to try out playing games with people online. And it succeeded. The service was unveiled at E3 2002. Boots of broadband connected Xbox consoles featured an early version of a game called Unreal Championship, which demonstrated the Xbox Live on the show floor. This game was developed to take advantage of the Xbox Live and was slated a debut on November 15, 2002, marking the first anniversary of the Xbox launch. Microsoft announced that 50 Xbox Live titles would be available by the end of 2003. They also said that the Xbox Live would feature a friends list, a standardized voice chat, and a single identity across all titles. From that point on, any Xbox game that has internet functionality would have this label on both the cover art and the spine. However, games like Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell and Brute Force have this bubble instead on the cover art, implying that these games only feature downloadable content, but that eventually changed later on. One of the standout features of the Xbox Live was the Xbox Live Arcade, XBLA for short. It's a digital platform that launched on November 6, 2004, and it provides a collection of downloadable games. Think of it like a virtual arcade, offering players a library of games that cater to various preferences. Originally, the software was obtained by ordering it on Microsoft's website. It was sent via mail on a disc that also contained a free version for Mrs. Pac-Man. Not a bad game to pick, but it is an odd choice. If you want to promote the Xbox Live Arcade, you could at least give away a free Xbox exclusive title like Conquers or something. That would have been a bit better. The service launched with 6 titles and expanded its library to 12 titles by the end of the year. Once it connected to Xbox Live, everyone could purchase additional titles by using a credit card or download a free limited trial version of a game. Most of these games were typically smaller compared to non-Xbox Live Arcade titles, but they were also pretty cheap, ranging from around $5 to $15. And they often showed unique gameplay and artistic styles. Now, the Xbox Live Arcade games on the original Xbox were serviceable, 
they get their job done, but there really aren't that many to choose from since it only has like 27 titles. It's a nice little bonus at the time, but it gets better from there. First, let's talk about the online multiplayer. It's one of the defining features of the Xbox Live, being able to connect with players from different parts of the globe. This was a game changer, as it transformed gaming from a localized activity to a global phenomenon. Let's zoom in on a specific game that played a pivotal role in the success of the Xbox Live, Halo 2. Released around 2004, Halo 2 was not only a critically acclaimed title, but also a pioneer in the realm of online multiplayer. This game offered a robust online matchmaking system that allowed players to compete in various modes, which marked a significant departure from the traditional split-screen and LAN party multiplayer of Halo Combat Evolved. While Combat Evolve established the core principles of Halo's multiplayer, Halo 2 took those principles and pushed them even further. The transition to online play revolutionized the way players engage with the game, offering a more accessible and competitive multiplayer experiences. And it's not just the online multiplayer. Halo 2 even introduced a wider array of weapons and vehicles, iconic maps, and innovative gameplay mechanics like dual wielding. These new additions improved upon the multiplayer of Halo, while also not straying away from what makes a Halo multiplayer a Halo multiplayer. But to the core subject at hand, by the time of the Xbox 360, all titles were required to provide at least a limited form of Xbox Live awareness, meaning that 360 titles must either have a multiplayer mode or simply an in-game feature that has an online functionality. In July 2004, Xbox Live reached 1 million online users, which then doubled the next year. The Xbox 360, released in 2005, introduced new features, services, and experiences to the Xbox Live that expanded the scope of online gaming. Because of this, Xbox Live underwent significant growth, strengthening its position as the leading online gaming service and community hub. With the 360's enhanced hardware, it made online play much smoother, reducing lag and improving overall connectivity. During this period, Microsoft introduced the Xbox Live Marketplace, a digital store that allows users to purchase and download games, add-ons, avatars, and themes, and the like. This paved way for downloadable content to become a major part of gaming that can enhance or even extend the life of some popular titles. Of course, Xbox Live is still there, but it flourished this time around. It now has a wider array of games, from classic arcade titles to indie titles. Games like Castle Crashers, Limbo, and Super Meat Boy became popular hits on the Xbox Live Arcade, which further establishes the service as a hub for unique gaming experiences. I had a lot of fun playing with these titles, even though most of them are either demos, require Xbox Live, or are just straight complicated for my underage brain. They have a special place in my heart for gaming. It's just that Xbox Live Arcade titles feel different than AAA titles, which are the kind of games I mostly played when I was younger. These games are much simpler to understand, and they have their own unique style to it, whether be it the art style or the gameplay itself. Now I mentioned this during Christmas, but I'll say it again, I never played online. My parents were pretty strict with me playing with other people around the world, which is understandable. I was pretty young at the time and I'd always play Call of Duty, so if I did somehow get access to playing online, I don't think I could survive. And you know how COD lobbies were back then. Where were we? The 360 introduced avatars, which are customizable characters you can use to represent yourself online. This is pretty much Xbox's alternative to the Mii. I'd spend hours coming up with the characters. There are tons of customizations, and you can even use accessories that belong in certain games. I can be whoever I want! And this is the prime reason why I love character customization in video games. You get to create a character that represents you, and you can play as that character in a video game. You can be yourself, or you can be Peter Griffin. Those are your two choices. Now, Party Chat exists before on the original Xbox, but on the 360 that became more prevalent, almost everyone that can play online has one. When it comes to the Kinect, players could engage in video chat or with a headphone. But I don't think a single person has done this with the Kinect. 
Why would you talk with someone through the Kinect when you can do the same thing with a headphone? The Kinect is more known as a peripheral for body movements, not used for Skype. Speaking of social features, Xbox Live offers a wide range of streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube, as well as rent or purchase movies and TV shows through the platform. My family barely used any of this, primarily because they think the 360 is a machine that can only play video games. Another reason is that we were more of a cable guy. Peace on Bombas, we're just poor. On May 21, 2013, a new console was publicly unveiled under the name Xbox One and was presented as an all-in-one entertainment device. What? This was a terrible press conference. And that's saying something because I strongly agree with the opinion that almost every Xbox conference is mediocre. The event focused heavily on the console's multimedia capabilities which went on for over 30 minutes before any actual video games were shown. And the majority of the games they showed are stuff you can already play on the 360. FIFA, Madden, and Forza Motorsport? You got more than one of each on the 360. Quantum Break did look interesting, and Call of Duty Ghost was Call of Duty Ghost. New dog model. But that's not the main takeaway here. Initially, the Xbox One would require an online connection and restrictions on used game cells. Not only that, but the Xbox One was so freaking expensive. This is why Xbox lost during this generation of gaming. Compared to the other two, the PlayStation 4 was $100 cheaper, and they even uploaded a video on how to lend games with your friends, essentially dunking on the restrictions that Xbox One had for its games initially. And the Wii U exists. During this era of gaming, online gaming became more and more prevalent to the point where it's not as fascinating as it was during its teenage years, but the Xbox Live continued to evolve, offering a more enhanced online gaming experience for the system. People who have or don't have an Xbox Live Gold membership still have access to the Xbox Store, which was formerly known as the Xbox Live Marketplace, which means they can still go to catalogs of games without needing a paid subscription. Xbox Live Gold, on the other hand, still remained a central component of Xbox Live, providing access to online multiplayer, exclusive discounts, and free monthly games. And this is where things get interesting. The Xbox Game Pass was a subscription service that offered access to a library of games for a monthly fee, allowing players to download and play a wide array of games, which eventually made its way to the PC. The Xbox Game Pass is currently one of the most cost-effective ways to access a huge library of games across multiple platforms. It's easily accessible and has a wide variety of games. Now, even to this day, I'm not subscribed to it, but a lot of people really enjoyed the service. Not only does it offer a ton of games, but also offers day one access to new Xbox Game Studio titles, which means people can play highly anticipated games as soon as they are released without needing to purchase them separately. And it also provides exclusive discounts for subscribers. Since Game Pass eventually made its way to the PC, a good portion of PC games are optimized specifically for the PC. So an Xbox Game Pass for PC was made containing a different set of titles compared to the console version. Some games may be available on both platforms, but the PC library has its own unique offerings. Because of this, cross-platform play was implemented, allowing Xbox One players to play with people on other platforms, including PC, and, in some cases, other consoles. Moving back to Xbox Live, clubs and LFGs, meaning looking for groups, was introduced and it enabled players to form communities and organize and find gaming sessions more easily. It even has its own dedicated chat channels, both text and voice, members can post text messages, images, videos, and more within the activity feed. A club focused on a specific game might have LFG posts for specific in-game activities. LFGs are incredibly useful, especially if you're looking for a co-op play, teammates for multiplayer matches, or help with certain achievements. Then there comes the Xbox Live Creators Program, an initiative by Microsoft aimed at warranting indie devs to create and publish their games on Xbox and Windows. It encouraged developers to engage with the Xbox community and gather input to improve their games. And this was facilitated through features like clubs, for example. One of the key features of the program was that it allowed developers to self-publish their own games on the Xbox Store. 
these games have certain features of the Xbox Live service, though not as extensive as a fully-fledged Xbox title. While most of these games may not have reached the same level of fame as major Xbox exclusives, this is still a huge plus for developers who want to make and publish their own games on Xbox. Now, cross-platform gaming is becoming more and more relevant, and that's when cloud gaming is finally a thing. Cloud gaming is like playing games over the internet without needing to install and play games on a device. This made it possible to play console games even on your phone. The catch is, is that it requires a ton of internet and takes up a lot of battery, especially if you're playing on a phone. But this is still a big deal and Microsoft began experimenting with it through Project xCloud, allowing players to stream Xbox games to compatible devices, including phones and tablets. This is really great, especially if you're subscribed to Game Pass and you live in America. Mixer, Microsoft's game streaming platform, was integrated into Xbox Live, allowing users to easily broadcast their gameplay and watch live streams. Since it was integrated directly into the system, it meant that users didn't need to download a separate app to start streaming. However, Mixer was shut down on July 22, 2020 as part of an agreement to collaborate with Facebook. Towards the end of the Xbox One era, Xbox Live seamlessly transitioned to support the Xbox Series X and S featuring the same user interface and everything. Xbox Live has played a major role in revolutionizing online gaming on consoles as a whole, offering features like online multiplayer, voice chat, gamer tags, achievements, and a digital marketplace for video games. Xbox Live has evolved over the years, expanding to include Xbox Live Arcade, social features like Club, and subscription services like the Game Pass. It has also adapted to cloud gaming and cross-platform play making gaming more accessible. Xbox Live is a fundamental platform for gamers to connect, compete, and enjoy a wide variety of games and content. All right, it turns out Steve Harvey and bikinis wasn't the problem with Soccer Phil, but that's not what I was gonna talk about anyway. So, real me this Xbox, why can't I play my 11 year old copy of Forza Horizon when I can just pirate freaking Starfield? Oh, hey, um, I've been thinking since the start of my journey about my existence. Um, I know I'm doomed to play the most difficult games of all time, but how would I know a difficult video game? Which is why I need to be prepared. I need to know what classifies as a video game. And this is... Fire Emblem? Video games all come in different shapes and forms, each having its unique flavor and direction compared to other genres. And one of the things that make each video game unique is its difficulty. There are so many games that struggle to find that perfect balance between easy, challenging, and frustrating. Difficulty can be easily summed up with the addition of increased enemy health and damage, more intricate puzzles, exploits, and this. There are a ton of variables involved with difficulty, so much so that I can talk about them for about 9 minutes. So let's tone it down a bit, maybe on recruit mode. Most video games have difficulty sliders, which lets players choose how they want to approach the game and what the players would benefit from them. Usually, higher difficulties simply give enemies more health and damage, which can make the gameplay a bit repetitive. When the difficulty is this artificial, it really downgrades your achievements. So this is probably the most important decision to make, especially when doing a first playthrough. How would I know which difficulty is the best, which is more fun? Obviously, the normal difficulty is the easy pick, but that's not usually the case. Playing any first-person shooter game or any game in general, the normal difficulty is just a walk in the park, which makes it barely indistinguishable from the easy mode. That's why every game with a difficulty slider should have that one difficulty setting that makes the game feel how it should play, how everything will be balanced. One example of this is Halo 3, which tells you that the heroic difficulty is how the game is meant to be experienced. Of course, this doesn't matter in Halo 2 because no matter what difficulty you choose, you're gonna get your cheeks clapped. Either that's just the game itself or a skill issue. The problem with difficulty sliders is that sometimes there's this gap between this is fine and death. You want the game to push you to your potential. And if there's this one thing, this one part or variable that you can't overcome no matter what you do, it sucks the fun out of the game. But 
that's the thing. You want to feel defeat to progress. That's usually the solution to being the most difficult games. You notice the errors in the game's design, you abuse the system, and when you finish the game that took you your entire life to beat, either the end may be satisfying or your enjoyment is ruined. You don't want this static point in the game where you don't feel like you can't get any better or there's no way or room for you to progress any further. Dark Souls, Zelda, fucking Ninja Gaiden, these games all have one fixed difficulty, meaning no difficulty sliders or settings. When playing these kinds of games, everything that you do and how you play incredibly affects the experience in the long run. It's the way a game is meant to be played. Now, of course, having one fixed difficulty doesn't always result in a perfectly fine game, but there should be at least one variable in the game that makes up for it. Take Dark Souls 3, getting your ass kicked by a boss, well you can XP farm to make your character stronger and maybe even farm to get this one broken weapon that can kill the boss in an instant. This doesn't mean difficulty sliders don't belong in the video game, or that games that have one fixed difficulty aren't perfect or good at least. Everyone should have options in how they want to play a game, but sometimes it might be a bit too much. Having customizable settings to make a personalized difficulty is cool and all, but it would have to go through a ton of trial and errors in order to have the perfect difficulty. You don't know how changing this and that setting can affect the gameplay in the long run. Especially in the first playthrough, you might not even know what this setting means. This is weird. It is challenging to make a single difficulty that's perfect for all players and how it makes the game feel like it should be. It all just boils down to personal preference. But what about games that are easy to play and pick up, but difficult to master? Usually these games are platformers. I mean, look at Super Mario Odyssey. Not the hardest game ever made. It is quite simple and easy, but people go nuts with this game. So many little things impact the whole game. You see speedrunners perform the most cryptic tricks just to spend even a millisecond less time than their previous records. And this doesn't only apply to platformers. This can be done to most, maybe every, video game ever. This also applies to which era of gaming a game belongs to. In the mid 80s to early 90s, the Nintendo Entertainment System became a turning point for video games. Games start to have a set amount of levels and stages, and with this change, difficulty is transformed. Before the NES, every arcade title was full of endless games designed to kill you fast and take your quarters. Pac-Man, for example, is just one repeating level. Now you might think, oh, it's just one level, how is this difficult? This is one reason this is a survival horror game. Now the challenge to making games for the NES at the time was, how do we turn a 10 minute game into something that will take an average of 3 hours of playtime to beat? Well, the answer is, be Ninja Gaiden. Cheap one-shot kills, broken enemy spawns, near to impossible jumps, confusing puzzles, enemies that knock you off a ledge, and glitchy as hell gameplay. I have more sleep than I have beaten NES games, which is funny because I only have a minute's worth of sleep a day. Even games that were specifically aimed at kids make Sekiro look like subway surfers compared to Super Mario Bros. 3. The thing about old video games is that the difficulty mostly comes from poor game design. Now, this doesn't mean they're all terrible and unplayable and you shouldn't play them, well maybe except that, but they're so buggy. The controls are sometimes unresponsive at times and the game itself might even glitch or crash sometimes. Ideally, a game should get progressively challenging as you play, regardless of the genre. But for some genres, it isn't consistent. Again, in Halo 3, the mission Floodgate brings back the Flood, the most challenging enemy in the entirety of the Halo franchise. And the next mission gives you a sniper rifle, one of the most powerful weapons in the game. I'm not saying the difficulty has to get more challenging as you play progressively, but the game can make reasons as to why the progressive difficulty in the game isn't consistent. Whether it's for the narrative or introducing a new in-game feature, it can be okay to not be consistent. And then there are the Kirby games. For games that do have progressive difficulty, it is vital to have checkpoints in the game. Looking back at NES titles like Castlevania and how many times did I mention you today? 
When you lose all your lives, you get kicked right back to the main tile screen and restart the whole game. Without checkpoints, players are forced to replay huge chunks of a video game, making it even more irritating and the replay value would go down dramatically. The iconic bonfires of Dark Souls and the like give the player a moment of relaxation from having to suffer PTSD and it ignites a spark of hope in a game whose world is gloomy and depressing. Now what about online games? Do they classify as being difficult? For me, no. You're facing against another player, and the challenges you face there come from the opposing player and not the game itself. It's like chess, the game isn't hard, you just suck. So you have to keep up with the latest builds and stuff in order to be better than your opponents. Games like Call of Duty and Overwatch lower the bar mainly because you have your teammates to carry you. And if you lose, well, you can just blame them and if you're the guy that got killed in the final kill cam, delete the game. You deserve better. So the thing about difficult games is that they grow on you. The more you fail and the more you try, the more you get better at the game. It all comes down to the phrase, get good. But what makes difficult games good? Is it the challenge? Is it the artistry? Personally, I think it's the progress, the journey rather than the destination. Like I said earlier, the more you play, the more you get better, and this applies to everything else in life. You have to lose in order to win. The thing is, behind every loss, one win is satisfaction enough. That's what I felt after just having beaten Dark Souls 3. Of course I had to look up some things online, but mostly the challenge comes from your experience. No matter what weapon or armor you use, the true key to victory is your skill and knowledge of the game. It doesn't matter how many retries it took you to beat this one thing at a game, you only have to win once and from then on you can progress. That's the beauty of difficult video games.